And now, Good Mike Work Commentaries and Greg Morgan presents the Winged Eagle Podcast. Welcome back to the Wingy, Monday Night Wingy this time. Hope you guys are doing well and welcome to your WWE Raw review for July 17th, 2023. We're also going to be getting into a lot of what I missed over the weekend. It was one of the busiest weekends in pro wrestling in recent memory. We had SmackDown and Rampage on Friday and Triple Mania. Then we had Collision in the Owen Hart Finals on Saturday along with Battle of the Belts. And then we had the G1 going on. There was uh, Impact Slam Slammiversary. And tonight's WWE Raw, we have SummerSlam coming up in a couple of weeks. We have All In and All Out coming up in a couple of weeks. There is just shit everywhere to talk about. And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see everything this weekend. But I did see enough of the interesting stuff that I feel like we should talk about across all of these shows. And if there's anything else specific you want me to get into tonight as we're shooting through this stuff, please let me know in the chat. Hopefully you guys are having an excellent Monday. For the past, I'd say, 27 years of my life, right around uh, 1995, uh, about uh, two years after I started working in my restaurant career, I uh, made arrangements to be off on Monday nights. And for the past 26, 27 years, I've been off virtually every single Monday night, just with the exception, few exceptions here and there, because Monday nights have always been my favorite night of the week, a night to chill out, watch wrestling, cook dinner, it's remained largely unchanged no matter where I've lived in the country my entire life. And tonight was one of those nice Mondays where I'm reminded of why I love this day so much because I thought we had a fantastic and fun Monday Night Raw tonight. Nothing spectacular, nothing crazy or over the top, but we had a title change and we had really excellent build for SummerSlam. We had, I think, at least three matches officially announced. Cody Brock, Ricochet Logan, and Seth and Balor all made official for SummerSlam. Actually, maybe four, Ronda and Shayna. I think is also official, and they laid the groundwork to getting that Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus match official tonight as well. So they are pressing on the gas hard here to get us all set up for uh, SummerSlam, and by my count, I've got over 10 matches listed for this thing, I believe. Only uh, a couple of them still aren't official, but you know they're probably going to be, and we got a big, big card in Detroit for SummerSlam this year. It's looking pretty good. Combine that with tonight's pretty decent Raw, right off the heels of a phenomenal pro wrestling weekend in general, uh, across AAA, across New Japan, AEW, Impact. It's been a weekend. It's been a, it's been a crazy few days, and I'm going to do my best to talk about this as intelligently as possible, even though I probably only got a look at about 30% of all of these shows, but I kind of picked out, cherry-picked the good stuff, thought we'd talk about that, and then you guys can fill me on anything. Fill me in on anything else. We're also going to talk about some wrestling news, just in general. Uh, Bailey uh, got her knee tweaked up a little bit yesterday on a house show. We'll talk about that. We've got the death of Mantar to discuss. Uh, Nick, Nick Aldis has uh, wrapped up business with impact and there is talk about him possibly going to wwe we'll talk about the cody peacock doc coming up on july 31st they ran a trailer for that also peacock has raised its prices apparently uh last week's smackdown we'll touch briefly on that because shotzi uh shaved her entire head uh on that show along with a couple of other things we'll discuss there like i said we'll run through tonight's monday night raw results we'll talk about this past Saturday's collision, which had one of the best tag team matches I've ever seen. Uh, FTR seems to have those a lot. They just had one less than a year ago against the Briscoes in that crazy dog collar match that, uh, you know, went down as one of the greatest ever. And the one that they had on Saturday with Jay and Juice uh, is ranking pretty high up there too. Phenomenal one hour long, best two out of three falls match. It's what pro wrestling is all about. So great. Uh, I've got some things to say about the Owen Hart finalists as well, the winners, I should say, uh, Willow Nightingale and Ricky Starks. Very happy with the two winners. Not Maybe not exactly how I book it, how I would book it, but it's hard to be unhappy to see either of those two get opportunities. And I'll uh, let you go, guys know what I think about Ricky Starks' questionable win over CM Punk later on. Also, we had Battle of the Belts on Saturday night as well. That's where they held the uh, Owen uh Cup presentation with Martha Hart, Tony Khan out there in his little cowboy hat, looking adorable. Great ship there. It's just been a weekend. The only thing I didn't really get a good look at, other than the current results and the points, uh, is the G1. Uh, the G1 Climax is going on 
Uh, you know, I looked at all the different blocks and it's early on still a lot of zeros, one and two points so far. Hard to get a feel of who exactly is going to win. But we have had a couple of upsets already, including, I believe, Kenta uh, dropping a loss. And Triple Mania had some interesting stuff going on there as well with a big QT Marshall win of Akingo and Kenny Omega. And Don Callis got attacked for real by a security guard or a cameraman or production guy or something that wasn't smartened up to what was going on and uh, got himself choked out. I really hope he's okay. Triple Mania was uh, not far from me at all, right down in Tijuana. Uh, I did not go down and make the trip for that, but it would have been cool. Uh, apparently, Don Callis did head up here to uh, San Diego get a, to get his neck looked at. So hopefully, uh, Don is cool. And if he, you know, one of the most over things a heel can do or one of the typical uh, tropes that heel, especially managers, can do is rock the neck brace. And that would be really funny if he started not rocking the neck brace and then blaming it on Vikingo's friends or whatever. Your friends and your thug family attack me. I don't know, something like that. Just to shit on Vikingo somehow and just be the sleazy fucking heel that he is. Take advantage of this, provided Don Callis is okay. It's been a rough couple of months for Don Callis. He got that nasty gaff on his head that was an accident. And now he's getting attacked uh, by a fan who didn't know any better Don better watch his back for a little bit. Shit happens in three. So be careful, Callus, uh, with your next move because uh, it's been a rough one for you. So that's kind of a rough estimate of what's on tap here for tonight. We're also going to preview this week's Dynamite. We've got Jungle Jack taking on Hook and Blood and Guts. Finally, this coming Wednesday, the Golden Elite taking on the Blackpool Combat Club with uh, Takeshita and Pac. That all looks good. As soon as we're done with one crazy weekend, we dive into another crazy week uh, coming up here. So it never ends if you're a wrestling fan, and it certainly never ends if you're a wrestling YouTuber. So I'm going to do my best to catch up on what we missed, hang out with you guys, and this should be a nice, nice, little nice Monday. So thank you for being here. Do me a favor, click that thumbs up button for me. For those of you who are channel members, Everybody who's been a channel member for longer than six months, I've got your names down there in the ticker scrolling across uh, the screen there. So thank you for all of your support. And if you are a channel member, we are going to resume our watch through of every single Saturday night's main event. We're going to resume that on Thursday with episode three. I was going to do it tomorrow, but I got too much going on. So we're going to do two, uh, Thursday, excuse me, this coming Thursday, 6 Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, Episode three, I believe it's December 1985. I'll put up a thumbnail and a link to that either tonight or tomorrow, so keep a lookout. And there is currently a poll up right now. If you want to cruise over to my channel, go to the community tab. There's a poll open to everyone right now to pick what pay-per-view we watch this Sunday. I've got it narrowed down to four classic pay-per-views. We've been watching Summer Slams all summer. And we might be watching one again this Sunday, but I threw a couple of Bash at the Beaches on there as well. So the four choices are Bash at the Beach 98, Bash at the Beach 2000, SummerSlam 2001, or SummerSlam 2003. Those are the four choices currently up on the channel right now. Let me get a look at uh, what we are looking at here with the current results to see if we know yet what we're going to be watching. Right now, SummerSlam 2001 has got 59% of the vote, under 100 votes so far. So if you guys want to go over there and... Uh, vote on that. I'm cool to do SummerSlam 2001. If that one wins, I'm fine with it. I'd be fine with 03. I'd be fine with either of these four. That's why uh, I put them up because regardless of which one wins, I'm happy because I'm down to watch any of these really. Uh, this past week, I made the decision. I wanted to watch uh, SummerSlam 1989. We watched that last night. Thank you to everyone who joined us for that, but that's one I've been wanting to watch for a long time and it never wins a poll when I put it up. So I just uh, made the executive decision to go ahead and do that one last night. Thank you to everyone who joined us. It was fun. And this week, we're either going to be doing a Bash at the Beach or a SummerSlam, depending on what the poll says. I'll give it another day, and I'll look at the results tomorrow. Whatever the results, to, like 24 hours from now, say, I'm just going to go with and uh, close down the poll. So we will see, but keep a lookout for those links coming up this week. I need to make sure... You can hear me. You can. Uh, no, as of right now, no watch along planned for Blood and Guts on Wednesday. A very busy week. I am into my busiest six weeks of the year right now at work. So things are really gnarly. I'm not going to purposely take off Wednesdays or anything like that. If I'm off and I happen to be off, I'll do it. But uh, this week is just going to be balls to the wall for me. So uh, no uh, dynamite watch along or Blood and Guts. But I have a feeling I will be saying something about Blood and Guts prior to Saturday, because the way these winged eagles now are, I don't even know when 
I'm going to do the next one, maybe Saturday before collision. We might have to come up a little bit earlier and do it. Things are weird now, but I still think we're going to shoot for Saturdays sometimes, maybe just coming up at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific, just in case we have a full two-hour podcast. There's still plenty of time to take a breather before collision starts. So that's why these Monday nights are kind of now labeled the winged eagles, because I have a feeling on Mondays, whenever we come up here and stream, there's going to be a lot to get into, and it's probably going to have to be a podcast style video. So that's what we're doing during all these changes and all this wrestling to watch and all this wrestling to keep track of. Uh, things are crazy. But anyway, let me go over to the chat, say hello to everybody, see what you guys have to say, and then we will start getting into Monday Night Raw. And then after that, we will start working on some of this wrestling news and talk a little bit about AEW and uh, all in, all out, that type of thing. Let me say hello to Devon Ricks, nearly a year as a shoot brother. Good to see you. Hey, Greg and friends, I'm thinking the stipulation of Brock versus Cody would be a three stages of hell match. What stipulation do you think their match would be? Good question. Right now, they've announced it with no stipulation, right? Uh, but I feel like since Brock came out and attacked Cody right in front of his mom and all that shit tonight, that Cody might want a stipulation. We've already seen him in a Hell in the Cell match against Seth Rollins, and of course, he was injured with the torn pec in that. So maybe the story here is because Brock put him in the uh, Kimura lock. Uh, maybe if he breaks Cody's arm, Cody has to go into yet another Hell in the Cell match injured. Uh, and win again. But maybe Hell in the Cell is too easy. Three stages of Hell, I would worry, is too long because SummerSlam has got a lot of matches on it. You know, you don't want to rush through these matches or anything, but I don't know if you have the time to give a match like 40 minutes. And I think a three stages of Hell match with entrances might require something like 40 minutes to do. And uh, that might be, I don't know, it might be too long. So I don't know if it's going to be some sort of... Uh, new idea or if it's going to be something that Dusty made famous Texas bull rope match you know Brock's been out there cowboy Brock and all that shit so maybe they do a bull rope match or something like that uh either way I think Cody should probably win this match and maybe they do book a stipulation to where Cody can win without you know pinning Brock or making him submit you know last year Brock was buried under anything over every under everything with the uh the last man standing match or whatnot so you could book a stip that not only allows Cody to go over, but protects Brock. But at this stage in life, does Brock really need protecting? I think Brock can eat clean losses at this point after the 10 years he has just had in the company, uh, you know, dropping a clean loss here or there to a guy that is a major star for them. You know, I mean, Cody tonight, he opened up the show and just seeing him come out there and just the pop and the cheers that he gets, it's you know, I really like Cody. I think his presentation is just fantastic. So I, at this point, I don't know what the stip is going to be, but I think uh, Hell in the Cell bull rope match uh, is possible. Um, anything other than that, you know, it could be anything. I don't think it would be something as simple as no disqualification or no holds barred or uh, what's the other one? Not no holds, false count anywhere, something like that, you know? They could do anything. Jay Lambo, good to see you. Zane G is in the house as well. Crazy Jay Rodrigo. Let's head, knock out some channel members like How Weezy, Victor Cologne, and my boy Kevin K Dogs Kennel. Good to see you, my friend. And Deshaun Robinson is here. We also have David Brown. Good to see you, Big MGM. And Tony, can a name Curran? <laughs> What's up, man? Uh, for those of you living in UK and Scotland, all WWE programs will be on TNT Sports. Good to know. I don't live in the UK, UK and Scotland, but I know a lot of you guys do. So that might be useful information to you. Red Raven Rucker, good to see you as well. Victor, oh, I got you already, Victor. Oh, there's the Juliet is in the house. We got Isaac. We got Michael Cuomo. We got Barry. I know Bailey. From what I understand, she's okay. At least that's what they think. I guess she's not out of the woods, but I haven't heard anything too bad yet. But we'll talk about Bailey here. I know Barry is very, very concerned. 7-7 uh, seven, seven, Matt in the house. Spaz Phoenix chiming in as well green p who else michael merville we've got i always lose my place whenever i do that oh, i'm good i'm good we've got spaz phoenix chiming in with two bucks great american bash 1991 man maybe we can do that after SummerSlam, after august 5th we need to do some August stuff, and that might be a good time to catch up on some WCW ones. So Great American Bash 1991. I don't even know the card for that, but that would be fun. After SummerSlam is an option. 
or some of these WCW shows. Uh, Punjabi prison, no, Zane, but I think Victor might have it right with the bull rope match. Uh, Spaz, Phoenix, five more, dude. Since they just did that awesome character turn for Shotzi on SmackDown, and unfortunately, Bailey is now injured, would a mini feud for EO's briefcase work? I don't know. Um... Yeah, because Shotzi kind of did that thing on SmackDown with Bailey and, and EO out there. I guess it just depends on Bailey. Have we heard something new? The only thing I saw today was a, uh, a Fightful Select report uh, acknowledging that she was injured, that she walked, uh, I think she was uh, walked on her own with no crutches or something like that, but she kind of had a lot of swelling and they can't really determine any damage until maybe it goes down. But the fact that she didn't need assistance walking is a good sign it is kind of what I read today. Uh, but if there's any specific injury that has been reported by Bailey, let me know. I didn't see it. Uh, so maybe it is, uh, maybe something has changed and Bailey did officially injure herself. I hope not, but that kind of leaves it up in the air. It depends on what happens with Bailey and what her prognosis is and whatnot in terms of how they're going to adjust what they're doing. But I don't know if we want to start doing feuds for briefcases. I don't know. And I haven't been able to tell. Like, it sounds like EO, EO is real trigger happy with this briefcase. She's threatened to cash it in a lot in the short time she's had it. So they might just want to hotshot something. Luckily, SummerSlam is coming right up. I don't think Triple H would have given EO Sky the money in the bank briefcase with the intent on her not successfully cashing it in. I feel like with Triple H in charge, that briefcase victory, same with Damian Priest, kind of told me they're both going to win it. But maybe they don't, and EO does. I just think, like, EO's got to come do something in that triple threat. Isn't that what they're going to do? They're going to do a triple threat or some shit, right, at SummerSlam because Bianca, Asuka, and Charlotte can't figure out their business, and we've had a couple of separate championship matches with everybody interfering, and it just seems like that's what they're going to wind up doing. So maybe EO just comes down and straight cashes in, but now if Bailey is on the shelf – for an extended period of time, and we have no Dakota Kai around either. EO Sky is all by herself. You know, I'd almost think about just turning her baby face or something at that point. It just depends on how injured Bailey really is. Don't don't know. Um, King of the Road match. I don't know, man. That King of the Road match. I'm pretty sure it was Dusty's idea. Dustin Rhodes uh, wrestled in that and got fired after the match. Um, that was a mess. That might not have been a dusty idea. I don't know. King of the Road match was straight up crazy, though. Um, good do first blood. First blood would be weird, though. You know, Brock bled his ass off in that in one of their matches, right? So I don't even know if first blood would work. Brock draws a lot of blood on his opponents. Could be over very, very fast. Stretcher match could work, too. Not pinning Brock, wheeling his ass uh, away. That's possible. Yo, Zach! Thanks for the five bucks. Cody's got to beat Brock decisively. No BS. Where should WrestleMania go after next year? Uh, that's not London after Philly. So WrestleMania 41. I think it could be any of uh, the cities talked about recently. I think uh, Minneapolis, um, Atlanta would be fine. They might come back to Arizona at some point. Orlando has been discussed um, again, or maybe that was a different pay-per-view that Orlando was discussed for, but I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I just, as all, I would just stay out of the cold and I would stay, I would maybe go indoors just to assure that you're not going to have any problems because when you're doing a city like Philly, you're just asking for trouble. And we saw Tampa a couple of years ago, right after the pandemic and that whole storm that blew through, blew through there, right when WWE's trying to get back on their feet and that happens again. And I don't know if I would be booking uh, arenas or stadiums in those type of cities. I don't know where it's going to go next. I think it should, it could be anywhere. And for 41, you know, it's kind of a unremarkable number. It's 41. It's not a milestone or anything like that. So if you're going to do one of those, you know, Markets like a Minneapolis 41 might be good to do, you know, where you have your 45 and your 50s, maybe in a little bit bigger of a city or one that WWE has more history in, something like that. But I don't know where WrestleMania 41 will be, but we should get an answer on that probably pretty soon. I mean, coming up in the next few months, I don't think it's going to be too long until we know that info or we get some pretty strong rumors uh, to that effect. 
Um, we could do a kennel from hell match. That's true. Um, yeah, and Cody beating Brock decisively, you know, that can still be done in a stipulation. It just depends on what their future for Brock is too and whatnot. But yeah, Cody is, uh, based on the reaction that he's getting right now from the audience, I don't know how you just don't put everything behind the guy. He's so damn over. Good to see Chad Jones, I've I've uh, pitched something similar to what you're saying. You know, maybe anything goes and Cody pulls out the forklift and pins uh, pins Brock the way Rock pinned Mankind. I have pitched that very same finish for Brock Lesnar's match, uh, or kind of a finish like that for Brock Brock Lesnar's match against like Dean Ambrose years ago. I'm like they should just get nuts and creative. And I thought about halftime heat when. Mankind lowered that thing. And even last year when Roman had his uh, last man standing match, I'm like, they kind of did something similar. They buried him under a bunch of shit. So I feel like they've already done that with Brock before. And uh, Cody, this is probably, if WWE does want to make Cody another superstar, put him, put him in the position in the company that John Cena had, you know, give him that spot a victory and a clean, decisive one over Brock at a big pay-per-view is something that a star of that caliber, I think, should use or could need and could use. So, yeah, I kind of agree. He's got to beat him. Um, dog collar. They could do the dog collar. I feel like bull rope would be more fun. Oh, yeah, Nashville is another town that's been talked about. I forgot about Nashville. They had a pretty successful... Uh, SummerSlam, so I can see them wanting to go back there for a mania. I could understand. Uh, Spaz, five more from you. Hey, Greg, what's a small wrestling aesthetic from the past that you miss? Myself, I miss having NXT having a black ring canvas. Oh, yeah, the old black ring canvas. I kind of, I don't know, I have a lot of them. I kind of liked some of the simpler sets, set designs. You know, sometimes just the entrance with the, the lit up WWF sign is all I really missed. Um, I don't think they even, ra- do they even hang the banners anymore? I can't, I'm trying to envision Monday Night Raw. I don't think they do. I don't think they hang Raw banners, you know? Like back in the day, the TV shows would have the two banners of the name of the show, or uh, pay-per-views would have the same thing. And I don't know why I can't visualize those now. I think they're all now, they're 3D rendered and all that stuff. So I probably miss the banners more than anything else. Um, Anything that I do miss, I feel like would be from way back in the day, like early 90s or 80s even. Uh, Jordan Card, appreciate the two bucks. Do I? Shit, I owe you a DM, don't I? Please hold. Oh, yeah, see, I, w- I was supposed to respond to you. Damn it, yeah. Uh, Jordan, I'm going to get back to you because I owe you a message about this very episode too. My bad, but let's uh, let's read that from Jordan. If I can get back to what I was doing here. There we go. There we go. Appreciate the two bucks, my friend. Should Jody Bagwell, should be Judy Bagwell on a forklift match? We could do that. We could put Judy out there, although Judy is no longer with us. So putting her out there would be super illegal. I looked it up, so you can't do that. But that would be something, and if a forklift was involved or any sort of machine, that's fun, but you got to remember it was done last year and done really well because that that image is still one of the damnedest things of Brock lifting up the ring with the forklift or whatever it was, and Roman goes tumbling back. Like, that couldn't have been set up any better. That could have easily been botched or screwed up or Brock didn't know how to work the controls or a piece of the ring went flying off and smacked a fan in the head or something, you know, but that was executed to perfection, absolute perfection. So um, I don't know if they're going to go that far with it again. You know, they might. But anyway, I think that does it for all of our pleasantries. We've been chatting for a while here, answering questions, super chats, that kind of stuff. Let's get in to WWE Monday Night Raw. Let me know your uh, letter or number grades of the show, A, B, C, or D, or 1 through 10. I thought tonight was a solid B-. minus. Uh, the show kept my interest most of the night. They did a good job of building up WrestleMania and they got right to it right away. Cody Rhodes opens the show, comes out, amazing crowd response as usual with Cody and uh, gets on the mic and 
talks to the fans a little bit, says he wants an answer from Brock Lesnar, and he'll wait no no matter how long it takes. He'll wait in the ring until 9 or 10 o'clock, and he'll just wait there until he gets his answer from Brock. He also acknowledges, because they were in Atlanta tonight, that his mom is in the front row, and Cody immediately got choked up. Just even the mere mention of his mom uh, got really choked up and went outside and kissed her, and they told everybody to enjoy Monday Night Raw. He'll wait for Brock since he's not here now. And his music starts playing, and he goes out to give his mom a kiss, and then Brock Lesnar's music plays. And I had a feeling, I was saying that during his promo, I'm like, Brock should come out now and just do the Zach Gowan thing, beat him up in front of his mom, or better yet, F5 Cody's mom. She'd be into it. So as soon as Brock's music hit, Cody was like, all right, mom, I'll be right back. He goes to meet him in the aisle way, but there's no Brock. The music stops. Music plays again. Brock's not coming. Cody is ready to fight in the aisle way. I kept expecting Brock to like come from over the barricade, and there was a younger man. Maybe it's a I don't know if Cody has another brother or some family member or friend of Cody's that was a young man that looked you know in a little bit of shape. And I was wondering if Brock was going to come in and maybe attack him, and then they would say, "Oh my God, that's Cody's cousin or whatever." and you know, get sympathy that way, or just F5 and his mom would also work. But instead, Brock doesn't come from behind. Cody decides to do that weird, I don't know how you describe that weird walking thing that he does. It's so fucking goofy looking. And he stomps back there. And almost somebody pointed out on Twitter that kind of looks like the Crash Holly walk, and it kind of does. And he does that weird walk uh, to Gorilla, and then you hear like the sound of a chair shot. And then, and then you see a chair go flying. And then Cody comes out and Brock follows him out. Brock attacked him backstage and then drags him all the way over in front of his mom. And I think hits him with an F5 on the floor in front of his mom, locks him in the Kimura lock in the ring, trying to break his arm and basically just takes out Cody, gets on the mic and accepts Cody's challenge for SummerSlam, which Cody laid down last week. We've known this is going to be the plan for SummerSlam for these two for quite a while. Uh, not surprising that they're, Finally, making this thing official without dragging it out too long. Now we got a couple of more weeks of build. We can get a contract signing or one more big pull-apart brawl or whatever, or the announcement of a stipulation, and that's something we definitely could see. Otherwise, this is just going to be a straight-up match, I guess a rubber match, and if that's the case, fine, but that means Cody's just going to have to cross roads and beat this guy, and that's a booking decision that seems a little simplified, and they might add some spice to that. So we'll see what they wind up doing, but Brock and Cody at SummerSlam is official, and uh, that's a big-time match on the card. So Cody is now on the road back to the title. If he wins this one, I don't know what they're going to do with him in terms of a championship. What I'm hoping is that Cody, you know, they might have to treat Cody like Undertaker. Like, for example, if the plan internally, because we don't know what it is, if the plan internally is for Cody and Roman at WrestleMania 40, that's still a long way away. And you got to keep these guys busy in between then. I still think there's plenty of meat on that bloodline bone to go through the Jay and Roman match and continue shit on for, you know, maybe even most of the rest of the year with those two if you really wanted to. And then in Cody's case, if he beats Brock here and every time Brock loses a major match, there's always the feeling, the thought, or the belief that he's going to leave and go take some time off again and all that stuff. So if that does happen, Cody wins the blow off against Brock. Who does, what does Cody do now? You would think after a victory like that, Cody's immediate target would be the world heavyweight championship, but that might be tied up because I would love, and we'll talk about it later, but I would love a scenario of a Balor winning the title and then priest cashing in on him. And if that's the case, that's going to ignite and spark a feud between them. So to throw Cody into the middle of that, you know, well, he doesn't even belong there. Let these guys, Judgment Day's got their own story. But what does Cody do? You would think Cody the wrestler, if he just beat a, a wrestler the caliber of Brock, he's going to come out and say, I want a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. So I almost feel like he's going to have to be like attacked again or he's going to have to feud with somebody to distract him from that. So what does Cody do after SummerSlam, assuming he beats Brock? Maybe he loses to Brock. Maybe he loses to Brock and they write Cody off TV for a while, but I don't think it's going to be like that. I think he'll beat Brock, and if he does, what does 
I don't care who the champion is right now, in my mind, Cody is the face of Monday Night Raw. He is. He, they, they present him that way. They book him that way. He feels like he is, uh, regardless of who the champion is. It feels like Cody is Raw. So he's going to have to do something. So do you have a return? I've mentioned Randy Orton returning, but every time I've mentioned Randy Orton returning, I have him doing something with Gunther or Drew or Riddle or one of those guys. Randy Orton has got a crap ton of history with Cody Rhodes. Randy Orton could come out after his Brock Lesnar match, or maybe the next night on Monday Night Raw when Cody comes out and says that he beat Brock, now he is going to be a contender for the World Heavyweight Championship. Seth might still be the champion. Balor might be the champion. Who knows? And just when Cody is going to set his sights on that, boom, out of nowhere, RKO. RKO out of nowhere. And Randy Orton is the next legend to lay down for Cody, to help build him on his way. You know, first Rollins, then Brock, now Randy Orton. You know, more notches on Cody's belt, um, beating, you know, some... Rushmore members of the last 20 years in WWE, you know, that could be a feud that would do enough to distract him, you know, and they could really have a good program, these two guys. Randy Orton and Cody Rhodes would not be like Randy Orton and legacy Cody Rhodes. This would be a whole different ball game being played. And uh, if you did that, Randy would come back as a heel, maybe one more final heel run, putting over Cody, just like Brock's putting him over. And hell, man, remember that, remember on, was it Raw 30? And John Cena and Cody Rhodes met in the middle and Cody asked him for a match and John Cena said, oh, I can't promise that. Well, what if you can promise it? What if you can promise it for like the Royal Rumble or Survivor Series? Survivor Series. Well, maybe then it might be team, team Randy Orton and Team Cody. I hope you guys don't mind if we're just thinking out loud here. But maybe... If Cody were to hypothetically feud with Randy Orton for the fall and beat him, exchange victories, whatever, but at the end of the day, win the blow off. And then maybe around Royal Rumble time or Elimination Chamber time, you can get a match with Cena in there somewhere. And, you know, in the span of a year, you know, Cody Rhodes will have defeated Seth Rollins, Brock Lesnar, Randy Orton, John Cena. He damn near had Roman beat at WrestleMania the previous year. There's, you know, everything, he's got all the momentum in the world. And then he somehow gets the match with Roman Reigns. I'm of the belief that he shouldn't have to win the Royal Rumble, but that might be the only way to do it. You know, yes, you can have the Elimination Chamber winner get a title shot as well, but I feel like the winner of the Rumble would challenge Roman Reigns. Wouldn't you think that wrestler, regardless of who it is, unless he's a pussy, is gonna, like if it's Gunther, for example, if you're Gunther, if you're in Gunther's shoes, you want Roman. He is the man. That title is the one that's been around his waist the longest. It's got the history, the, the value of that championship, what it would mean to beat Roman Reigns after three and a half years holding the title compared to beating a Finn Balor or a Damian Priest or a Seth Rollins who has only held the title for a short time. No matter who wins the Rumble, that wrestler should want to challenge Roman Reigns, is my point. So that's why I'm like, shit, I don't see another way for Cody to get there other than winning the Rumble. Because otherwise, it's going to mean the winner of the Rumble is just going to, for some reason, want to challenge for the World Heavyweight Championship. Maybe they will, but that would seem stupid to me. And then the Elimination Chamber determines Roman's challenger. Or they defend the belt there, you determine his challenger some other way. So WWE would have to get creative in my mind, to do Cody and Roman again, unless it's like Cody, Cody's second attempt at the same story. Like in order to, to achieve what I failed to achieve last year, I have to win the same match that I won last year. I have to win the Royal Rumble. Otherwise, I'm on a different brand. I have no path to Roman Reigns. My only way to do it is to win the Rumble. So, you know, maybe he comes in a number 30 or whatever the fuck and wins it. Who knows? But the Rumble, it would be nice if that could be used for somebody else, especially last year. It was Cody and Gunther, the final two. It would be nice to see Gunther get the nod this time. 
you know, so it just depends, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can work it out to where Gunther already has got like a feud with the world heavyweight champion. So then when he wins the rumble, oh, this is easy. I'm challenging you because I fucking hate you. So maybe they can do it that way or they can get creative. You can make shit up. Pro wrestling is just fake shit. You just make everything up. You don't, you know, you can just come up. You can pull a reason out of your ass, invent a new reason to figure out how to get Cody to Roman at WrestleMania without doing the Royal Rumble. Or you could just simplify and do a massive trade. Big trade. Cody Rhodes for, I don't know, whoever the second biggest star other than Roman is on that show. And you do Cody for, who the hell's on that show? I can't even think right now. But, you know, do a trade that way. And then you got Cody over there, and maybe it's easier. I don't know. But still, you're looking at that Rumble winner. That Rumble winner, if it ain't Cody, you would think it's going to challenge Roman Reigns. So it depends on what the story is, what the plan for Cody is, and how they want to get there. But in between that time, what he does the rest of this year, if he keeps knocking off legends one at a time and he stays over, I've talked about WrestleMania next year maybe being a little bit predictable if they just go Cody and Roman again. Are they really going to do Cody and Roman part two and have Cody lose again? Is that really going to happen? I mean, I think everybody in that building is going to know Cody is going to win. And predictability is not always bad. But if it's so predictable you can see it coming a year out, that's sometimes not good. And we saw that happen with John Cena and The Rock. I was totally on board with two John Cena and The Rock matches spanning the course of two WrestleManias. But once it became clear what their plan was, oh, they're going to 50-50 book this shit. Rock's going to win the first one. Cena's going to win the next one. They should tie in a heel turn or something to make this interesting. And they didn't do it. It kind of was boring. It fell flat. And fans complained. But one thing I've noticed differently about Cody, too, is that, and you guys can maybe answer this for me or maybe uh, offer input on it. But one of the things I've maintained and I've said throughout the years over and over on my channel and on my podcast regarding John Cena. And when he was getting a lot of the hate, I said that, yes, there is a big part of his booking and the way WWE books him and pushes him that does give you that vibe of shoving him down your throat. But that's only because he's their biggest star. They shove all of their world champions down our throats. They always have. That is never different. But the problem is this is a guy that fans don't like. And I've always maintained that it was with a certain generation of fans. It was with a certain age bracket because John Cena, once he kind of got away from Thugonomics and after the Benoit murders, Cena went towards that role model, hero for kids type of persona. The fans who were getting into wrestling around that time, the fans that were maybe 15 to 25 in that age bracket, had just left the Attitude Era. And the Attitude Era was going on when they were kids, when they were just kids. And they probably weren't even allowed to watch a lot of what was going on. Where me, I was, I was in my mid-20s living on my own. I could do whatever the fuck I wanted. But if you're nine, your mom probably doesn't want you watching the guys telling each other to suck it and chicks flashing themselves and language and blood and booze and drugs, all that stuff that was going on during the Attitude Era. A lot of the fans of that generation missed out on that because they were too young. Now they're old enough to enjoy that type of content, and WWE's flipped it on. WWE's flipped the script. Now, oh, sorry, you might be an adult now. Now you're 18, and you can, you know, you're you're all ready for, you know, the middle fingers and the beer and the blood, but we're not going to do that anymore. Now we're going to go TV PG. We're going to have this Barney Fruity Pebble fucking uh, baby face champion. We're going to have a cartoony ass show on Saturday mornings, and Saturday morning slam, remember that? It reminded me of WWF mania, just dumber. And they did all of this, and I maintained forever. I'm like, the fans are so mad. That's where all this anger comes from, is because they didn't want that. They just hit the age of adulthood, and WWE's reverse shit on them. And I think it really frustrated them, plus the way Cena was booked and shoved down the throats. That really created this, you know, this uprising of hate to where it would just became the thing to do to hate John Cena. Even if it didn't make sense, doesn't matter. You know, the guy's cancer, can't wrestle. He's killing the business. WWE will be out of business. TNA will be the number one company if they continue to push John Cena. All these ridiculous things that were nowhere near even remotely true. 
And there was so much just disgust for John Cena, just the way he was and the way he conducted himself, the way he went out there and kissed the babies and talked to the kids and did the Make-A-Wish stuff. And really, his promos were very white meat, very, uh, very heartfelt, and at times very emotional. Remind you of someone in WWE right now? Coming out, kissing the babies, tearing up at the mere, mere mention of his mom. And what is the crowd doing? They're cheering. Because those bitter, angry, juvenile, adolescent fans that were so mad that they had to put up with this bullshit TV PG hero, they've grown up now. They've grown up now. They can appreciate this. And what's funny about the timing of this on Cody is like, think about Cody. And granted, WWE's doing things better with Cody and his presentation and his booking that he, than they were doing with Cena. And you got to remember, Cody's only been back in WWE for about a year if you take out his injury. But in the ring, he's only been in the comp back in the company for about a year. John Cena it took about five years for this to happen, right? Maybe less. Maybe from he was over in 03, 04, 05 by the time they got to 06. So maybe three, four years there and shit started to burn off with Cena. But Cody's only in his first year, but still you see a distinct difference. You know, you don't hear that those those boos. The fans really like Cody. They enjoy singing his song. They don't find him to be corny or cheesy, even though his promos, you know, they're not edgy or anything like that. But Cody is an excellent professional wrestler. Think about who his dad is. He's not out there trying to be his dad or trying to be more over the top or flamboyant. Cody really is being himself. And I see a lot of how WWE presented. There, there was somebody in the chat last week who got all butthurt because I mentioned Cody and Cena in the same breath. But they are, they do have similar roles in the company right now. Cena is not in the company. He's off doing movies. So the spot that Cena had, he left an empty hole there. You got to plug that hole with something. And with Roman as their other biggest star, who's currently a heel, who can still do the talk shows and everything because he represents the company very well, Cody is the guy that's going to give you that John Cena level of, uh, of professionalism. You saw him the other night. At the house show, he stuck around for an hour after the show, signing autographs, and the production team is like breaking down the set around him, and he's just out there taking pictures, doing whatever he can. He seems to want this. He seems to welcome it. If they do strap him up, he's going to be an excellent representation of a world champion and a champion WWE should be proud of to send out there into the world and say, hey, this is our guy. Not to mention, he happens to have one of the most famous fathers in all of professional wrestling's history. That's pretty cool. Dusty Rhodes is the first memory I ever had in professional wrestling, seeing him choke superstar Billy Graham in a magazine. And that's cool to see his kid out there making it to this degree. And I, I was thinking about that tonight, the comparisons between Cody and Cena. I'm like, if you put this Cody Rhodes in 2010, or whatever year you guys think Cena's hate was at its maximum, and you put this very same Cody in that environment, the fans might reject that because that was just that that's that type of character. The fans did not want that. So my my question is, what is Cody doing? What is Cody doing that's different than Cena? What's Cody doing that gets him the cheers compared to Cena getting the booze? When you look at their promos side by side, I, I would argue John Cena might be a better promo cutter than Cody Rhodes. John Cena is an excellent promo cutter. They say a lot of the same things. They're always very complimentary to the audience, to the universe, to the fans. And they're always very kind and very good to kids. They always acknowledge family members. Family is very important to them. Maybe more so to, maybe more so to Cody, because uh, I guess uh, Cena is still single, uh, from what I understand. Is he? Or did he get married? I don't even know. But uh, they have so many similarities that... I wonder if it was just a timing thing. You know, Cena came around at the wrong time. If Cody came first and the fans were like, fuck this, we don't like this guy, he's kissing too many babies, we hate him, we want Austin and Rock and we want swearing and middle fingers and blood, right? And then after Cody has that long polarizing career and he's off making movies right now, Cena comes in with his Cena character, who's a hero, who little kids dress up like. You know, because all those fans that were shitting on Cena years ago, I bet you it warms your heart to see a little kid in the audience. Like, I've been starting to go to shows again for WWE since 2018, and to see the little six-year-olds in the green shit, it's fucking adorable. I'm happy they have that to look up to. 
you know, but younger fans are more selfish and they don't think that way, but older fans do. So I think a lot of those anti Cena fans and those ones that were the loudest and most profoundly dumb about the whole thing, a lot of them are probably looking at Cody in a completely different light than they were looking at Cena back then. And it's a really interesting kind of dynamic there because I see the two of them in, in, a, in a very similar kind of spot in the company. And once they do put the title on Cody, time will tell if he'll turn into Cena because it's really hard to compare the two right now because John Cena had 17 championships and 10 years of, you know, literally them sticking them right up our rectums. You know, we're still early on in Cody to where all of that hasn't worn off. And I've been worried ever since Cody came in that his popularity was going to fizzle, but it feels like it's rising. And now it's starting to be about that song. That's going to wear off too, because Judas was fun for a while. And now people shit on Judas. Now everybody finds it's too dumb and it's too lame. And why are we singing that? And I'm like, everybody was singing. Everybody was singing it. Everybody. The people who say it sucks was, were singing it at first. Yes, you were. So Cody has said that that's his music for life. I hope that the fans singing the song doesn't do it a disservice in the long term to where the fans don't want to hear it anymore because Cody apparently wants that to be his song. And I'd hate for the fans to ruin it because they sing it. But just the fact that they're singing it to that degree, those woes are, it's the new thing in wrestling. And WWE's popularity is, is rising. I mean, basically the minute Cody got there, that also coincided with Vince McMahon getting caught with his hand in the pussy jar and all of that stuff happening. But it's interesting timing. Like the minute Cody got there, everything started to change. Numbers were up. Attendance were up. Look at the numbers they're doing for some of these Raws. They had over 10,000 tonight in Atlanta. A lot of the uh, the ticket sales for upcoming TV events are selling out. Like, what the fuck? Three years ago, two years ago, whatever it was, prior to the pandemic and even after the pandemic, um, but I definitely remember like 2018 and 2019, like shit sucked. There's no reason to go to a show. They were tarping off half the damn building for Raws and SmackDowns. And we talked about it. It was a topic brought up on this podcast several times. We were like, why does WWE book these big arenas when they're only drawing 3,000 people for Raw? You put it in a smaller building where it looks more uh, intimate, you can have a better atmosphere. And that's what we saw AEW do. They don't book these big arenas unless it's a big market or it's a pay-per-view. Otherwise, you know, the arenas are generally in the five to 12,000 seat range and they fill it up pretty nicely and it looks good for TV. And WWE had that problem of filling like a fourth, a quarter of the building. Now they're selling out. Huge, just huge difference. So anyway, thank you for indulging me in my random Cody thinking out loud because I've been thinking a lot about him, what his future is, what they're going to do with him, what his legacy in the company is going to be what his legacy appears like it's going to be, you know, with what WWE wants to do with him. He's got a big Peacock documentary, two hours long, released on July 31st. Looks very good by the trailer, but I do wonder how good it's really going to be, how, how genuine it's really going to be when there's probably going to be very little discussed about AEW because you can only discuss them so much uh, without them actually being involved in it. And I don't think they are. Uh, I don't think they're using any of the footage, but I'm sure Cody will. The the initial the, the word aid all elite wrestling the words might be uttered maybe once on the documentary, but I don't think they're going to really spend a lot of time on it. Um, I don't think, but if they did, it would be interesting if they had a little snippet from Tony Khan or something like that. But you got to think that's got to be a bitter pill for AEW too. You know, they they did not know what they had in Cody, and and granted, who would have? I didn't. We didn't. Some of the fans singing the praises of Cody right now probably weren't too much of a fan of his in AEW. I wasn't. I was shocked that he left there, and I did not think that it was going to automatically equal a better pro career for him until I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know, WWE does own all the dusty shits. Good reason why I think Brian Pillman should come in. And I was right. I mentioned when uh, his departure was rumored, I said he should... Go to NXT. They should scoop him up and get him in that get him in that performance center with those coaches in that facility and polish him. And I think that's what they're doing. He's already been there working out and stuff. 
So with Cody, he had the legacy there and all of that. And I think Cody has an opportunity now. That's why people ask me sometimes, oh, do you think he'll go back to AEW? And I'm like, probably not. If I was Cody, I would not from where I sit. I mean, unless WWE shits the bed with him and they completely change their tune and their feelings on him and the push ends and, you know, he's not doing anything and he's in catering, then maybe. But uh, I don't see that happening. I think they want to um, capitalize on his name and his legacy and what that means to be the son of Dusty Rhodes and to make it to the level of popularity that he has made it, blazing his own trail. And think about that. Think about Dusty and Dustin and Cody. All of them, to their credit, had three careers going in three different directions. They were all different from one another. And while incorporating in, in influences from their dad and, and Cody from Dustin, but they all had different characters, different looks, um, mostly different wrestling styles, although you see all three of them uh, do a lot of the same stuff. But that's pretty, that's good. I mean, yeah, shit, Brett and, Brett and Owen would be the only guys, you know, that I could think of, you know, when you think of uh, two brothers, but the dad too, you know, Dusty, Cody, and Dustin. What a trio, man. But anyway, I'm just going on and on about Cody. If uh, anybody wants to crop this part of the podcast out and send it to him, good Mike works in love with you. He just talked about you for an hour on his podcast. But anyway, so Brock, like I said, destroys Cody to open the show, and he accepts for SummerSlam, and that matches on. Then we get the big uh, match between Gunther and Riddle. This was for the IC title, was it? I thought it was. It might not have been. I can't remember. But Imperium is banned because Drew McIntyre is off filming that movie. So he's doing the movie thing. He's not on TV. This is just Gunther and Riddle straight up. It's a shame that Riddle has had the problems that he's had because when I was watching this match, I was like, you know, this match... At WrestleMania, if both guy, you know, if Riddle would have also been pushed in a similar way to Gunther, this could have been one hell of a showdown. But instead, it was just a straight up match. Gunther beat Riddle with the power bomb, hops on the announce table with his belt after the match, and basically just tells Drew to bring it, and that Drew is not going to take the title off of him. And I hope not. I've talked a lot about Gunther's title run. Recently, he just surpassed 400 days, and he is just a few weeks away from breaking Honky Tonk Man's all-time intercontinental title record, which does happen on September 8th. So if Gunther can make it to September 8th, he will be the longest-running intercontinental champion of all time, and I just cannot see them not doing it. Get out of that match at SummerSlam. We know we're going to get McIntyre and Gunther at SummerSlam. Get out of it. I brought up the Randy Orton return earlier on. Maybe he comes and starts something with Cody to distract him from the World Heavyweight title into next year when he can win the Rumble and then challenge Roman again. Or you can have Randy Orton return right here and possibly attack Drew McIntyre. Or maybe Drew McIntyre turns heel. I mentioned that. Maybe he can't beat Gunther. He had a heck of a time beating him at WrestleMania too, him and Sheamus both. So maybe he's hitting Gunther with everything but the kitchen sink. Gunther even kicks out of a Claymore. Drew gets pissed and is like, well, fuck. And then he just goes to cheat and he still can't do it. And then he just winds up getting himself disqualified and he gets pissed or whatever. But you could also do a double turn. I don't know if I want that. I like Gunther as a heel. Uh, I like heels that win. I like heels that win and don't need help and don't need to be pussies and just win because they're badasses. Brock Lesnar is like that. That's why I like Brock so much. So Gunther is a heel, I think is money, but he's still over with the audience. The audience does appreciate his ability. And I think Imperium also is very entertaining. What's uh, How does uh, Kevin Owens say it? The Kaiser and the other one or whatever, or Gia Vinci or whatever. I think they're, they should get a chance to like maybe develop more lighthearted sides of their personality or something. And maybe a, a face turn for Imperium is something they do. I could definitely f see a way for Gunther and, and Drew to swap in the match. I feel like Drew needs to do something different, assuming he has re-signed and re-upped with the company. He's not going anywhere. The talk of his contract tracked ending very soon. We've all heard that. But he's back now, so if he's back and he's re-signed, they need to do something else with him. So I think a heel turn could work. 
and a double turn would be even more fun if you think about it. And it would keep the title on Gunther and then shit on September 8th, Whenever the next TV after he breaks the record, you bring him out on SmackDown now as a babyface and you present him the classic Intercontinental Championship with the black strap. Fuck off with that white shit. It's got to be black. Black strap. Give him the new belt. Shit can that other one, Medusa style. And uh, that in a perfect world would be the scenario that good Mike Worker would like to see. But that's not going to happen. But I do think that Triple H, what would be his motivation? You know what I mean? Like Triple H is a Gunther guy. He, you know, he helped develop Gunther. We know how he feels about him. And to keep the title on him this long and for Gunther to be this dominant. And now he's got a chance to make history, end a 36-year-old record, one that's been a thorn in my ass ever since I was 10 when I had to watch that fucker beat Ricky Steamboat on TV when I had no idea that was even going to happen. I was not even worried at all that Ricky would drop the belt. Next thing I know, Honky's holding the ropes and winning. Kind of won a lot like uh, in the same way Ricky Starks beat CM Punk in the finals of the of the Owen. So I'm ready for this thing to end, man, and I just don't, I don't know what Triple H's motivation would be to not do it. Just to troll us, uh, he should want, you know, a record that's that old, on a championship that's always been viewed at as a workhorse title. It's had some rocky roads there in the late 90s and 2000s, a lot of title changes, and it was really being hot potatoed. But it feels like it's being reestablished as a major championship, and Gunther has done a great job with it, better than Austin Theory in my mind within the uh, with the U.S. title. So to, do, to undo that, and when you're so close, this when are you ever going to find or get this record done again? Who who's gonna hold the title this long? If nobody's been able to hold that championship in 36 years longer than the honky tonk man, and here here you are just two or three weeks away from it, uh, you gotta do it. So I have to I have to believe in my heart that that's the plan, and Triple H is not fucking dumb, and Gunther will break honky tonk man's record. So if they do that, you gotta get out of this match somehow, unless you just want to straight beat Drew clean, which I'm fine with. But if this is a guy that has just re-signed with the company, I feel like if I'm booking it, I would I would book a heel turn in conjunction with it or something like that instead of just straight beating him. But either way, Gunther's got to hold on to that belt. We cut backstage after that. Liv Morgan and Raquel Gonzalez have to defend their titles tonight. And I was a little bit skeptical of this one, or not skeptical, I should say. Uh, I was, I was uh, sniffing out a... a championship switch here because we've heard the rumors of Rhea and Raquel at SummerSlam. They've already set that up. Sonia and Chelsea are over. I love them so much. Then this match takes place at the top of the hour and I'm putting all these things together. I'm like, okay, Rhea. Oh, and, and Rhea, by the way, uh, approaches Raquel and Liv who are at Gorilla prior to their match. Rhea headbutts Liv Morgan and then attacks Raquel, injuring her leg. So you put all that together, top of the hour time slot, you got Raquel and Rhea, you know, kind of being penciled in, in a championship match for SummerSlam, which means Liv and Raquel won't be defending the titles. And uh, Raquel is now injured and Chelsea and Sonia, you know, WWE are going to put the tag belts on them because the tag belts are fucking useless. And if you have any women tag team or combination that's even the least, least bit over, you have no choice but to put the belts on them. And I think Chelsea and Sonia are a lot more than a little bit over. They're a lot over. I've loved the two of them together the minute I saw them on screen together. They have just worked and clicked with me. Their level of obnoxiousness, their, the way they, their personalities are so annoying, it's in an entertaining way. Unlike even though I, even though they had their moments, I didn't love the Iconics. I'm sorry. I just didn't. I thought they just were fucking ridiculous. But they were funny at times. Billy Kay, well, that, not excuse me, what did she say? You, you've got to be joking me and her voice and the screeching and all that. There were plenty of times where they had me chuckling, for sure. But at the end of the day, not an Iconics fan at all. So Chelsea and Sonya give me what the Iconics did not. And the two girls can kind of work you know, which is also pretty awesome. So the stars were aligned here. I was ready to see it. I was so happy. And uh, that was going to be happening. 
uh, later on. So after Rhea attacks Liv and Raquel, we get a Judgment Day promo. Uh, Dominic apparently has a match tomorrow night for the North American title on NXT against Wes Lee. I kind of hope Dom Dom wins that. Him and Rhea can be the championship couple. Like, think about it. Why would they book Dom Dom in that match? It's random, isn't it? Maybe not. Well, Judgment Day's been going down there, so it might not be that random. But I feel like if they wanted to do crossover match or put Wesley in the ring with someone for him to retain his title, I wouldn't do that against a heel that is one of the most over heels in the business right now in terms of the crowd reaction he gets. To send Dominic down there to lose to in an NXT match, title or no title, seems like a weird thing for Dom to do. So I would have Chad Gable do that or somebody like that do that, not Dom Dom. So in my mind, Dom Dom's bringing back some gold gold, and I'm expecting him to win the North American Championship tomorrow just for a short time. He'll bring the gold for the photo op. Just think about it. If uh, Balor, Balor wins that heavyweight championship at SummerSlam, think about that picture. Rhea, she ain't losing to Raquel. Dom Dom, North American champion. Balor, world heavyweight champion. And Priest, with a briefcase that could essentially be cashed in on any one of these, even Rhea, if he wanted to. Hit her with the, I don't even know what is, what is his finisher? <laughs> Hit Rhea with whatever Priest's finisher is. And win the women's title. That would be a pretty badass visual. To see every member of Judgment Day with a trophy. And when you think about it, if you don't want to break Judgment Day up yet, eventually you're going to have to do this, and Mommy and Dom Dom are going to have to split. But if you're not ready to do that yet, and you are going to be putting the belt on Balor at SummerSlam, then you're going to have everybody with a trophy except for Dominic. You know, and he's already kind of the younger, weaker one as it is. You know, now he's kind of left out, and maybe that, that starts the, puts in motion the, the faction's demise. This balances him out. So without, without me even watching NXT, this is how I feel like it's got to go. I think Dominic's going to win the championship tomorrow. Am I wrong? I hope I'm not wrong because I want to see him with some gold. So if that happens tomorrow, fans, are, here's what they're going to say. Here's what they're going to say. I'll just save you the trouble. Why would they do that? Why would they have an NXT champion uh, on Raw? Why are they moving up the North American title? Why, why, would they, why would they just send someone down from the main roster to beat one of your big, biggest stars? Like, they're going to think that it's like wrong and stupid or something because that's just what they're programmed to th do and think. But it's going to be temporary. It's going to be temporary. You can see this shit. You can see it happening before it even happens. If Dominic does, in fact, win the North American title from Wesley, it's just going to be long enough for them to have all of the shit on TV in the Judgment Day. Just a week or two after SummerSlam, you book the rematch. Hell, you book the rematch on Raw. Give Wesley a fucking Monday night match for the championship. And he wins it back. Simple as that. Wins it back on Raw. Now he's got rub. He's got exposure on a big night. Raw's been doing pretty good numbers in the ratings. I mean, it might be 11,000 people in the building for that match. And he gets to have that match with Dominic on Raw for a championship in front of a, a big house. There's no negative there. And WWE has made it clear that they're already kind of starting to mix these brands with Nick Khan saying, you know, oh, they might want to think about NXT not being a developmental brand anymore because they just can't figure it out. They don't know what they want to do. So now, now they are starting to incorporate more, sending Raw and SmackDown people to NXT to maybe boost that rating. It's been working. So I see no issue with this at all. But I just know how fans are. I like know how fans are. Dominic, one of the most over heels, they're going to stick a belt on him temporarily, uh, you know, just to, you know, fuel the momentum of this faction. And fans are somehow going to find this bad. They're going to pick apart and then it doesn't make sense. I'm like, no, you thinking it's wrong doesn't make sense. Dipshit. So when those people come out of the woodwork tomorrow, start complaining when Dominic wins the title, direct them to whatever our time code is here and have them listen to this. Uh, so anyway, after uh, Judgment Day starts talking their crap, Owens and Zayn come out. They set up a tag team championship match in the main event. So hopefully this time everybody will get along. And then after that, we have the women's tag team championships on the line. 
Liv Morgan and an injured Raquel Gonzalez, who earlier on in the trainer's room was being attended to. Perfect hair, perfect makeup, not disheveled or beaten up at all. Looks like a million bucks, gorgeous, sitting there with an injured knee. I'm like, you don't even look beat up. Like, at least... Like, at least have her hair messed up or something, or maybe her makeup smeared. Make it look like she's been in a fight. She looked like she was ready for the Oscars. And, but only going as a uh, a guest because she was not going to win any Oscars for her performance, saying, ow, my knee. No, no, no. I have to compete because this already happened to us before. So can you clear me, doctor, or whatever? And he's like, in my opinion... You know, you're not technically cleared, but you can wrestle. And then, of course, she wants to, re- like, just make it feel real. If WWE ever wants to win an Emmy, they're going to have to cut this, please let me compete even though I'm injured crap out because it's just the worst acting. So, of course, she's going to go against doctor's orders. They are just setting the table up here. You can see it coming from a mile away. Match starts, of course, heels, target, Raquel's injured knee. Um, this ends up leading to uh, Raquel not being very effective. They are able to corner Liv Morgan in the ring. Uh, the unprettier, or unpretty her, I guess it's called, to Liv Morgan for the win. And you knew it, man. I could feel it both, mostly through this whole match. I'm like, it's going to happen. And uh, she got pinned. New tag team champions. They celebrated marvelously. They had pyro going off. They did a hilarious... Uh, interview backstage after where Chelsea's trying to butt in and thank everybody, her cats, her hairdresser, her her mailman, all these people. And she keeps cutting in and you can tell like they're already planting, but they probably already been doing this, but Sonia is clearly like, all right, chill. Like she's going to get annoyed with Chelsea at some point, but they had matching gear. This is a team. That's an actual team. They are a team, you know, granted they were slapped together at first, but they have formed a team. They feel like more of a team than live in Raquel or any other combination of women that they threw together. One thing I will say about the Iconics, as much as I was not a huge fan of theirs, they were a team, and uh, at least a team like them won the tag team championships. So Chelsea and Sonya were getting over. And in my mind, you know, you got to put the belts on an act that's over. And Chelsea has been remarkable. You know, she had her stint, her run there before, and like they brought her out on Raw, didn't she wrestle Charlotte? She didn't do anything. She had they, she had no opportunity to, to, I guess, let her personality come out or get this character out. Like Triple H has been great with her. She plays her role perfectly, and she's got she's got a future. That Chelsea kid, I'm telling you, she has a future because she's just too entertaining and she can work pretty damn decently in the ring. It'd be cool if like one day she went back to her like crazy gimmick with the lipstick and shit, but this Karen type of character, she's really good at it. And I love it. I love Chelsea and Sonya. I love MJF and uh, Cole together too. There's some great pairings right now in wrestling. Next up, we had a sit down interview with Seth Rollins. He'd been preparing for this for an hour. They kept cutting to him sitting there with his shirt with all these holes in it i'd be worried that like the point of my nipple would like poke through one of those holes it would hurt be annoying so he's sitting there he's got all his shit on and before they can really start talking finn balor shows up kicks out i think it's kevin Patrick. i think it's him doing the interview kicks him out and sits in front of seth and they're basically staring at each other and talking some shit it was very cinematic looking it's kind of like uh Remember when Kane and and Shane McMahon feuded and they did that? And I remember at the time watching this barfing, going like, ugh, ugh, like I was watching it live. I'm like, this is the dumbest fucking shit. And they do the thing where Kane and Shane McMahon are in the restaurant, right? So Kane and Shane McMahon are in the restaurant and they're talking or whatever. And they do the typical thing that you see in TV shows and movies. And it made, I could see it coming a mile away. And then, like, Shane says whatever to him, and then he stands up, and he pulls money out of his pocket, and he throws it on the table and walks away. And I'm like, what are they doing? You know, so the only thing missing (laughs) from Seth Rollins and Finn Balor here was somebody standing up and throwing money down. But unfortunately, they weren't in a restaurant, so there's no reason to do that. But it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. Uh, Balor wants a match at SummerSlam. Eventually, Balor attacks Seth Rollins and beats him down. And then later on in the night, it would be announced that match is official now, like we predicted right before Money in the Bank. Before Money in the Bank, I said, Seth Rollins and Finn Balor are not going to wrestle one match and be done. 
Uh, I've said that a lot throughout the years. I'm usually right. There is the occasion. Somebody actually does wrestle one match. Cody and Roman is a good example. But most of the time, like with Trish and Becky, Cody and Brock, we talked, we said this in each one of these scenarios that they, they're not going to just have a one and done here, you know? <laughs> so uh, this is going to be a program. So Seth winning at Money in the Bank. Now you can set up the rematch at SummerSlam. I hope Finn Balor wins. I honestly do. I love Seth as the World Heavyweight Champion, but I think Judgment Day got over and they should be rewarded. That faction has done amazing since uh, they dumped Edge. Everybody individually has gotten over. Rhea is one of the strongest, most feared women in the history of the company right now. Dominic is over, you know, to levels unseen since fucking Muhammad Hassan. It's nuts, and but for good reasons. Not go-away heat either. It's like the right kind of heat. You got Damian Priest, who's turning heads, and he's carrying around that, that green briefcase. And you got Balor, you know, a bona fide main eventer, a guy that already had one world championship win in the company years ago that he got taken away from him after an injury. Triple H was a big part of that. Triple H was the guy that chose, handpicked the next dude. Well, if it can't be Balor, I'm going to make it my other NXT boy, Kevin Owens, and gave him the championship, literally handed it to him on TV. Maybe this is a way for Triple H to make this right for Balor. Same opponent, another championship that's brand new, just like last time. And last time, you were the first person to hold it. This time, you'll be the second. You know, Seth is the first. So you do this match again. Balor wins again. Now he's world heavyweight champion. He's in judgment day, so you can cheat your balls off if you want to here. It's no big deal. Seth Rollins is now world heavyweight champion. You fast forward to the next night on Raw. Seven years earlier, Balor beat Seth Rollins and also appeared on Raw in a sling, having to give away the championship that he just won, the brand new championship. Now he's in the middle of the ring as the brand new champion, and he's not injured. And he gets on the mic and he says, you know, seven years ago, I was right in this ring. I wish I could do Balor's accent. I was right in this ring, and I never got a chance to defend my championship. After I beat Seth Rollins at SummerSlam, I come out here with the belt, and I never even get a chance to have a run with it. Well, it's going to be different this time. And then, bam, from behind, Damian Priest attacks him, wears him out with a chair or whatever, just fucks him up, picks up the briefcase, hands it to the referee, ring the bell, hits him with whatever, one, two, three, and snatches it away twice now to Finn Balor. This has happened. First time it was an injury. This time his one title defense uh, was when he was completely unconscious uh, and he was attacked from behind and his stablemate, his buddy, his friend, is the one that took that from him. His one chance, it's been sticking in his crawl for all these years, and now he's finally made it back to this moment. He's got his belt back, same scenario, I beat the same opponent. It's a do-over. Life gave me a do-over. I'm not going to squander this opportunity. And then, bam, oh my God, that could be amazing, right? You know, or you might want to wait. Like I said, you want that photo op, right? You want that, that photo op with Balor and Priest and Dominic with the North American title and Ripley because Raquel ain't beating her. You want all of them with their trophies, right? So maybe, you know, for the story, I think it would be awesome if it was the next night on Raw, but that might be something you want to stretch out. If Balor is going to win the title, obviously they're going to want to factor in, you know, Priest cashing in on him. So do they want to wait and tease it for months and continue to tease the dissension and the distrust in Judgment Day, that can only go so far. You can only do that for so, so many weeks where Priest or Balor every single week has to say, you're not going to cash in on me, are you? And Priest has to make up some bullshit. You can only do that so many times. So I think the biggest, the biggest value, how you make it the most memorable moment is have this happen to Balor twice. And then... Triple H seems to like long title runs, but then you could hot potato the belt a little bit if you wanted. You know, Priest is now champion, and then Balor now is pissed, and he's he demands revenge, and then they do a rematch, and then Balor wins the title there, and then carries it for a while before dropping it back to Priest or who knows. 
Maybe they do a rock man kind of thing with these two. But I feel like Balor winning is kind of what I want to see, you know, and they can do it a lot of different ways. You know, Seth can continue his, you know, Seth isn't just going to take that sitting down either. He's going to want his rematches or whatnot. So they might have to book Seth Balor three at whatever the September pay-per-view is. I don't even know what time, what, what the next time they're going to Saudi. Anybody know uh, the next Saudi uh, show? So then if you book the third match there for the championship, maybe that's where you do the cash in, you know? So my idea of it happening the night after SummerSlam is only to repeat history with Balor, but you might get more mileage out of it if you waited, you know, until the next pay-per-view. Seth gets a rematch, and that's where Priest cashes in, you know? And that, that way you can keep Judgment Day together. You know, maybe Priest cashes in, but he doesn't really take advantage of Balor, takes advantage of Seth, and... That keeps them on rocky ground, but still the same ground type of thing. I don't know. Just me thinking out loud here. Uh, after the interview beatdown, we had pretty fun match. Alpha Academy uh, taking on the Viking Raiders in a Viking rules match. I don't like anything medieval or anything from this time period. I'm just not a fan. Uh, but they had all this shit set up, all this wooden crap and this horse and this weird platform thing. And it turned out to be pretty fun. It really was. And Maxine Dupree has turned out to be a pleasant surprise. And uh, I saw the quote Ronda Rousey said, and she's right. Somebody finally made singlets sexy <laughs> because Maxine looks great and everything she wears out there. And she's very good. I didn't realize how kind of entertaining she was at first because that model gimmick was, you know, somewhat funny, but you couldn't really get a read on her personality very well. This is a whole different story. And she's fit in really well with the Alpha Academy. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like the Varsity Blondes and Julia Hart, but on steroids. It's awesome. So they've been pleasantly entertaining and a pleasant surprise. I've loved that. The Viking Raiders kind of stole her uh, varsity jacket or whatever, her graduation jacket. She regains that in the match. She took a spear from Valhalla through the table that was set up uh, in the ring. In the end, the Viking Raiders got the win, but it was a fun match. I had a good time watching it, but uh, but I usually don't Love the Viking Raiders. I just think it's a goofy-ass gimmick, but I'm kind of getting into this. Uh, the whole Valhalla thing is working out, and they've been having some fun matches, and this this feud has been surprisingly entertaining. We knew we were going to get a follow-up on Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey tonight. We got that next. Shayna Baszler, in record time, tapped out Nikki Cross, and... In the Kira Futa Clutch, after the match, Ronda Rousey appears up in the press box, and she kind of looks old school. She looks like when she first came in, she had the long the hair down, and she had the Piper jacket on, and she looked a lot like how she looked the night that she showed up at the Royal Rumble in her debut. But unfortunately, WWE has got to stop putting a microphone in front of her face, <clears throat> And whoever's scripting her promos, it's way too many words for her. One of the problems that Ronda Rousey has, I have this problem every now and then myself, is saying her words too fast. And she was just... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> she sounded like uh, that Steve Carell in that movie. He was blah, 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 or whatever. And it was just starting to run together, you know? And she just... She speaks too quickly. Uh, they... They have not trained her in that regard well. You know, you got to have a little bit of a pause between words, between thoughts, between sentences sometimes, especially to let something sink in or let a moment breathe or whatever. But she gets way ahead of herself, and that tends to be something you do when you're nervous. But Rhonda has been around long enough. None of this shit should make her nervous at all. And uh, she just doesn't, she doesn't speak well on the mic. She has just not gotten better over the years. If anything, she's gotten worse. Uh, they were able to hide uh, her issues before, but now it seems like they might even be trolling her just by adding so many words. And I feel like she, I said this earlier tonight that she's got like the Ron Burgundy thing where he will read anything that's written for him. And I feel like whoever wrote Rhonda's promos didn't put spaces between the words and she just read the whole thing as one continuous word. But after she talks a little smack about how big of a star she is and how small of a star Shayna Baszler is, Shayna goes to chase her up, but the security stops her, and then Ronda Rousey announces that the two will, in fact, face at SummerSlam. She goes, Ronda, I'm going to, or she goes, Shayna, I'm going to help you out again. I'm going to get you a match at SummerSlam, and uh, I'll see you then, bitch, and storms off all awkward. 
it was dumb. So the match should be fun. I'm looking forward to Shayna and Ronda Rousey if this is going to be Ronda's goodbye. I hope she goes all out to make this memorable. I hope that Shayna can benefit from this victory. Putting down Ronda Rousey might be a good time for Ronda to blade. I know they're not really using blood, <clears throat> but maybe they can make a small exception here just for the realism of it and uh, have Ronda, you know, maybe get knocked out Holly Holm style or something. You know, she went into that match as the favorite. And I watched that live too. It was crazy. And she got nailed and caught early and just the fucking upset of all upsets. Maybe, maybe kind of book a finish like that uh, of like Ronda and Holly Holm where Ronda... You know, she comes out all cocky and arrogant and throws a few, and Shayna's got a few answers for everything, tags her a couple of times, rocks her, and next thing you know, before she even blinks, it's over. Something like that might be fun, you know, and put her down and have Ronda just, you know, staggering off or knocked out or anything like that. And then Ronda either leaves or, like, I, like I've always said, you know, I don't believe that this is necessarily a one-off. This could be Ronda's exit strategy, but it doesn't mean that SummerSlam is her exit. You could rebook another match here and do like a loser leaves town because I don't think they've attached a stip yet because Ronda just announced it tonight. So they could add that. Now, maybe next week there's a loser leaves town added to it. If not, maybe you do the one match and then you do a return or maybe even a third match, depending on how long Ronda's contract runs or how many days she has left. It's another 90 days or something. You can get her into October and do it there or something like that. It just all depends, but we'll see. We'll keep our eye on it. If next week they add a stipulation, that could be our answer. Uh, we had Becky Lynch out on Miz TV. This was okay. Becky's uh, outfit was something else. And her, the whole point of this is try to convince, try to convince Trish Stratus to fight her at SummerSlam, which of course Trish doesn't want to do. She's rocking the old school nose guard uh, from back in 04 and or whatever year that was, and she's backing down, of course. I don't need to fight you. We already fought. I beat you. I'm not doing that. And then Becky just keeps on and keeps on, and oh, I've accomplished more than you and whatnot. And then she winds up uh, beating up both women or attacking them. She uh, headbutts Zoe with Trish's nose guard, so she rips off the nose guard on Trish, puts it on, and headbutts Zoe Stark with it, and the two of them scramble off. But uh, Trish on the mic did... Uh, end up agreeing to the match and made it official. And she says, okay, I'll fight you after uh, Becky trying her heart out to make this feel important, but it didn't much. But I still think the match has got potential. The women are going to have pretty decent representation on SummerSlam, three, three or four big matches. And a couple of them, not even title matches. That's what I like to see. We're going to see that with Becky and Trish and with Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey. Think about that. Isn't that, isn't that one of the things that I've been saying about the women's division is that they, there's never any storylines or issues or feuds outside of the championships. And even then the storylines and feuds are shit. I was like, we should get some feuds that don't involve a title. Actually put some thought into angles that don't involve belts. It's not that hard. It's worked fine for years. And now we're starting to see that two big matches on SummerSlam for the women with no title on the line. I don't recall ever seeing that on pay-per-view where we've had two separate one-on-one -on -one women's matches with no belts on the line. It might've happened in, in the last five years, but certainly hasn't happened much further back than that. You guys can find out Bronson Reed versus Shinsuke Nakamura was up next. This one was, Oh my God. It, even though Raw was fun tonight, we've all been watching wrestling so long. At least I have. A lot of you have too. You can just sniff this shit out. I mean, the minute Bron I see Bronson Reed on TV, I'm like, okay, I don't even know who he's wrestling. All I know is Tommaso Ciampa's interfered. 100%. 100%. Wasn't even concerned about it. Turns out to be Nakamura. Match starts. I leave the room. I go downstairs because I know Champ is going to interfere. I just assume he's going to cost Bronson Reed the match. I come back up right as he interferes. It was just perfect timing. As soon as I walk back in here, Champa hits the ring and they're freaking out. And I'm like, oh my God, like fucking clockwork. Jumps in the ring, attacks Bronson, but winds up getting uh, Nakamura disqualified. Uh, so it had the opposite effect. Nakamura was pissed, kicked a Champa in the face. And then backstage, he said, tell people to stay out of my business. 
So he seems like he's getting mad. He might be going back to a heel. Um, I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that Chan like Nakamura says people are getting in his business. I think Champa was getting in Bronson Reed's business. It just spilled over to Nakamura. So we'll probably get a match between these two, which won't be bad. Nakamura and uh, Tommaso Champa. Um, but Nakamura going heel, possibly. And then we had the main event tag team titles on the line. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defending against Dominic Mysterio and Damian Priest. So before the match really gets going, Seth Rollins shows up. He dives and attacks Finn Balor. And uh, we then had later on in the match, because Rhea Ripley is out there causing all kinds of problems and ruckus, and Liv Morgan shows up to attack her. That was kind of near the end. The match itself was very good, and you had Rhea Ripley jumping on the apron, I think, to try to help Dominic. Liv Morgan then ran down to get revenge for Raquel Gonzalez, or Raquel Rodriguez, excuse me, and speared or tackled basically Rhea Ripley, and they went over the barricade into the timekeeper's area in a pretty good-looking spot. That left Dom all by himself to eat a halluva kick. He went down, and Owens and Zayn pinned Dominic for the win to retain their tag team championships, and I liked it. It was, uh, it was fun. Getting a lot of Owens and Zayn against the Judgment Day, which I get they're feuding, I understand that, but it, it does feel like this largely was the same match we got in the main event last week and maybe even the week before. Um, but Owens and Zayn getting the win, I guess we're going to get that tag match again. I mean, if there was some interference here, maybe they can book it again. Dominic and Priest against Owens and Zayn at the pay-per-view. It feels like they might do that. I'm not sure. Uh, somebody mentioned the booking like being backwards, like Liv Morgan came out to attack Rhea. It should have been Raquel coming out to attack Rhea. That, yeah, I guess I could see that, but I think the reason Morgan attacked her is because Rhea Ripley is going to face Raquel at SummerSlam, but maybe before then on TV, she faces Liv Morgan, you know, in the buildup. So we probably get, I wouldn't be surprised if we get uh, Rhea Ripley versus Liv Morgan on Raw next week or leading up to SummerSlam. Um, that was the end of Raw. Basically, that's all I got there. I know I have not talked to the chat in about an hour, so I'll go over here and see what you guys are saying. Then we will run through the SummerSlam card, and then we'll just run through a few tidbits of this weekend's wrestling since I've been talking for a long time. So thanks for hanging out, chilling out with us tonight. I also have to talk about a little bit of wrestling news. Um, but let me scroll back to where I know I was because I know I got supers. Um, Zach, I remember getting that one from you. Um, Oh, yeah, Jordan, I got that one. All right, we're not too far behind. JJ Leg, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for the five bucks. Hey, Greg, recently turned 23, and Survivor Series is within driving distance for me. Any tips for a first-timer when looking to buy tickets slash going? It's all different now. Um, when I was going to shows when I was your age, it would be a Ticketmaster thing, calling on the phone and having them order them that way. Now you got a million different ways to, to get tickets. It just depends on how much you want to spend. Um, Historically, I have not loved buying tickets like being the next one in queue because I kind of like to pick where I'm at. And sometimes you just got to take whatever the best available or whatever they say the best available is. And then you get them and I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, you get them for the good price that you should be paying for tickets. But a lot of times I find myself going to a third party site, you know, like a StubHub or whatever, and that sucks. But it really allows you to pick where you want to be. Sure, you got to pay a little bit more but you're going for the experience, right? So that's the way I look at it. I don't want to, I'm not trying to go on the cheap. I'm trying to go and experience it. So uh, it just depends on, you know, kind of what your budget is, but there's really not too much, too many tips you would need unless you want really good seats for the least possible price. Just be there. Just try to get in on those pre-sale codes. Try to be one of the first people on queue, but I haven't ordered tickets like that in a long time. All the, you know, WrestleMania and Double or Nothing and the Dynamites I've gone to. Uh, in recent years, I've I've just stub hubbed everything. So, um, but if shows are within driving distance, that can be fun. I used to traipse all over North Carolina because they were full of uh, cities that all hosted wrestling: Raleigh, Fayetteville, Greensboro, Charlotte. You know, Greenville, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, Hampton, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. 
all of these towns were, I don't know, two to four hours maybe in driving time. So they were doable. And when I was that age, we would go everywhere to the shows. It was great. Fun times, man. Max Pokebra, nearly a year for you. Family member was bad timing. Cena came after Austin and Rock. Exactly. That's my point. You know, so it was also bad timing. It wasn't necessarily all Cena, although he did have uh, glaring issues that I understood. Um, it was the timing of it. And that's why I said, if you put Cody in that spot years ago and Cena's spot back then, Cody might get the same type of response that Cena got because he's not what Austin and Rock was. So it's all about the timing and it's all about how you feel. Ridge Hollow. Yeah, Ridge Holland. Who did he hurt last week? He hurt one of the uh, pretty deadly guys, right? Yeah, so he's got a little bit of a history here. He dropped Gargano. There was a video of him dropping Gargano on his head in NXT. Uh, we know what happened with Big E. I think these are all unfortunate situations. I mean, you go through these motions a lot. You know, all these reps in NXT, these coaches watch you do this. If this was something he was regularly doing, you know, during his training and stuff, they, you know, would be working on that. I think these are freak occurrences, unfortunate, unlucky. Um, I'm sure he's been talked to, but you know, when it comes to stuff like that, it's really hard for me to like, I guess, agree when a fan says it, you know, like, I don't know, even with Nia Jax, who clearly needed help, there was something annoying about just a little fucking twerp, you know, that, can't barely fucking move. Just little, uncoordinated. And he's going to criticize, you know, a real professional athlete. I'm like, we can't do this stuff. We're in no position to, to criticize or to claim that they're unsafe. You're not in the ring. You're not a coach. You don't know. You know, and the people that he's injuring uh, apparently are not holding Ill, any ill will towards him. But this happens a lot. Uh, Rob Van Dam used to get this uh, same type of shit. He was hurting a lot of guys with his... Very dangerous uh, Van Daminators throwing the chair and clocking people, and he had a little bit of a reputation for being unsafe. There's been plenty of guys that have had that rep, but unfortunately with Ridge, all of these instances have kind of been in like suplex situations, which involve head and neck, and uh, maybe not do that move <laughs> anymore or something. But the thing about WWE is they're a professional, and safe company. They're going to have the safety at the work of the workers at heart. They're not just going to let this shit happen. Do you think they want to see somebody paralyzed on Fox on Friday night? No, they're going to deal with it. It's not our job to deal with it. It's fan. It's WWE's job to deal with it. So whatever they have to do with the situation with Ridge Holland, that's something that we as fans, unfortunately need to trust the WWE to do and not stick our big nosy snouts in that business. Because we don't know. We're not qualified. Um, let me see who else had anything interesting to say. No, Zane G. I wish it was back to Gonzalez. I forget. I know she's Rodriguez now, but my God, WWE in their name changes. I can't keep track. My bad. All Out or SummerSlam, which show will be better? I don't know. I think it's anybody's guess. It's going to be completely... Uh, subjective, wh whatever, you know, you know what the tribals are going to think. If you're a frothing at the mouth, AEW nutcase, it's going to be all out. If you're somebody that hates AEW and you tune in to Jim Cornette's podcast and whack off and spooge all over your walls nightly to his voice, which people do do, you're going to say SummerSlam. To a wrestling fan like me, I got to wait and see. I think both Shows have potential, I, although I don't think it's going to be all out. I think it's going to be all in. All in or SummerSlam. I mean, SummerSlam on paper here is looking pretty damn good. Look at this. Listen to this card. So we've got Roman and Jey Uso, Cody and Brock, Seth Rollins versus Finn Balor, Gunther versus Drew McIntyre, Rhea Ripley versus Raquel, likely, uh, Trish versus Becky, um, Shayna Baszler versus Ronda Rousey, Asuka, Bianca, and Charlotte likely in a triple threat, possibly even a cash in there. Logan Paul versus Ricochet. Owens and Zayn are going to defend their titles, most likely. And hopefully we get LA Knight and Austin Theory. That sounds fabulous. <laughs> it, it's going to be tough to beat that. But one thing 
AEW does really well, even though WWE is a much bigger company than them. One thing that AEW does really, really well is deliver on pay-per-view. And that's one thing they uh, honestly have been more consistent with WWE. Lately, WWE has been fantastic and most of the time they're good, but they've had plenty of stinkers out there, but WWE has been around longer. So the longer you have, the longer you're around, the longer you're going to have the potential for shitty pay-per-views. But AEW always comes through, and I don't think they're going to want to squander this opportunity of being in Wembley and having a memorable show in their company's history. It's like they're in a weird position where they, even though this is a big, big accomplishment for them, it's like they have to hit a home run. They really, really have to hit a home run. So they need to put together a card that they can ensure that will happen. And I think they will. Um, speaking of AEW, Saturday's collision was incredible. My God, so fun. Calgary, Saddle Dome was the home. I think that's the same building that the 10-man tag in your house took place in, right? That was great. Had a good turnout there. Crowd was hot for it. Um, David Benoit was in the front row, Chris Benoit's son, who we have seen from time to time. He was a part of that uh, Dark Side of the Ring episode. And we've seen pictures of him when he was a kid. And even when he was a kid, he looked a lot like his dad. But holy shit, my God. He can't look any more like Chris <laughs> if he tried. There's no reason for him to ever say, oh, I really wish I looked more like my dad. You look exactly like your dad. Fucking exactly. To see that face sitting at ringside. On top of all the, uh, the, the terrible things that Chris Benoit did, the lives that he took, Think about the lives that he ruined. The lives in his family that he ruined, and specifically his kid. Because by no fault of his own, this kid has got the face of a murderer. This kid has got a face that if he ever wanted to get into professional wrestling, it's just going to be really tough to do. And it's not his fault, but like, I can't even blame it. It's not fair. No shit, it's not fair. But sometimes life isn't fair. If I am booking AEW or WWE, I'm not touching this kid unless I don't, unless I bring no attention that of, of his history. I'm not going to celebrate his name of Benoit, but that's his name. You know, I'm going to have to change his name, give him a completely different gimmick. You can't really build him or bill him as the son of Chris Benoit, even though that's what he is. But if he gets in the ring and he ha if he has any Benoit-like moves or mannerisms in his moveset, you know, then you combine it with that face, there's just no way you're not going to think about that. And fans are going to constantly talk about Benoit, constantly compare him to Benoit. And it's going to draw attention to the ugliest thing that's ever happened in pro wrestling. I know if I'm WWE, they just can't. And is that fair to David? Hell no. But it's reality. You just can't. It's just a bad situation. It sucks for him. It sucks for him. Now, I don't know. I just heard this at one point. I remember hearing rumblings that he was wanting to get into the business. But how do you really do that? And I don't know what's going on with him lately, but I'm glad that AEW showed him kindness and had him come to the show. Jericho, I know, has gone out of his way to look out for the kid and has taken care of him a few times. And I think David's been backstage at, WC at AEW shows, excuse me, before. But, you know, if this kid ever wants to be like on TV or anything, it's just. I just don't see how you can do it. I think the best they can ever do is just be really kind to the family. And if they're ever in the area and David wants to be there, give him some front row seats, you know? But man, he looked a lot like his dad. One of the brightest spots of all of Saturday night was Ian Riccoboni on commentary. Also, he has officially signed with AEW, so he's going to be doing some of these collision shows. Uh, apparently, he was talked about before they settled on Kevin Kelly. His name was brought up, but since Kevin has New Japan commitments, he's not going to be there every week. So Ian is going to be hopefully a, a regular on Collision, and we'll see him a lot uh, on AEW, and maybe they'll even uh, get him on Dynamite from time to time. But he is a great pickup. I love his commentary. He's great and very, very happy for him getting that deal. And he looked tremendous uh, in his suit. <laughs> In his hat. Everybody looked awesome. Uh, Tony Khan, I got a huge kick out of him. They opened up with the 
two out of three falls uh, AEW tag team title match with FTR defending against Jay and Juice. And my God, Juice Robinson has made me completely turn the tune the turn the corner. Excuse me, I had no interest in the dude at first. He didn't really do much for me, but man, he has really worked hard to just accentuate his personality. And this match was great. The match they had previously was great. We knew this one was going to be good, and we knew we, they were going to want to outdo that one. So this one went a full hour. I'm trying to watch this on my phone at work, and I keep coming back to it. Like after 20 minutes into the show, 25 minutes, I keep thinking, I'm like, well, the match has got to be over by now. And I'm like, it just kept going, kept going. And you could tell by the time it got to like 45 minutes, I'm like, holy shit, they're going to go an hour. I just hope they had enough time to get everything else in. So fantastic match with Jay and Juice getting the first fall even, and then FTR having to battle back the great double sharpshooter spot with both guys holding hands as the crowd was going nuts. So good. It's what pro wrestling is all about. FTR getting the win in the end, coming back two straight falls to retain the tag team titles. And Jay White and Juice Robinson have been phenomenal since uh, coming into AEW. They've been a lot of fun to watch, and I'm excited to see what else they do. But they fell short of their tag team title bid here, and FTR continues uh, to have the best matches in the world. My God. Them boys know what they're doing. In the finals of the Owen Hart tournament for the women, of course, we had Willow Nightingale against Ruby Soho. I had a tough time predicting this. I predicted both matches wrong. I thought they would go with Punk and Soho. I mentioned the possibility of Willow and Ricky Starks winning and how I'd be fine with that. And I was also fine because I didn't care who won. I like all four of the finalists. So I was happy either way. But I felt like Punk and Soho would be what they would do. Punk has just come back. He's the face of collision. Ruby was in the finals last year, fell short, even had a special entrance with Rancid being there. I just felt like it would have been her call. But one thing I did say about the Owen tournament in recent podcasts was that I felt like the finishes of these need to have like clean-ish wins. Maybe not completely clean, totally squeaky clean, but clean-ish wins or wins with minimal interference uh, from bad guys. You know, for example, Ruby Soho, it would be weird for the outcasts to come out there, kick the shit out of Willow and spray paint her and help Ruby win. And then Martha Hart has to present her husband's trophy to somebody that just did that. So I felt like if there was any cheating, it was going to be minimal. Or I even mentioned Ricky Starks beating CM Punk like by accident, like somebody comes in and Maybe Joe shows up and hits CM Punk and Ricky Starks doesn't see it. And then he pins Punk, but doesn't know that Joe helped, something like that. I felt like it could be a scenario like that. But what we saw from from these matches was the opposite. Ruby Soho lost to Willow Nightingale, which is great because Willow Nightingale is the personification of a babyface. Everybody loves her. She's just a gem. And uh, wrestling business doesn't deserve this one, <laughs> I'm telling you. So this warmed my heart. Couldn't happen to a better person. She wins the Owen Hart Cup. And when it comes to representation, I talk about that a lot, you know, with WWE and AEW. When they look back at these moments 10 years from now, how are they going to look through those eyes? And I always think about that when I think about WrestleMania main events and Royal Rumbles and briefcases and championships and shit like that. So at least now when you're going to look back in the history books, you're going to see Britt Baker's name and Willow Nightingale's name at the top of the list. And then on the men's side, it's going to be Adam Cole and Ricky Starks. And that ain't too shabby either. Now, Punk and Starks had a pretty good match. Punk had mixed reaction, had a mixed reaction from the crowd, despite being in heart themed gear. Uh, and in the end, Ricky Starks got a little bit of a roll up on Punk. He had, had him near the ropes. I can't remember if it was an inside cradle or a victory roll, victory roll type of thing. Whatever it was, it was a roll up on Punk and Starks grabbed the rope and the referee didn't see it. Counted three. Ricky Starks wins. CM Punk is surprised. What the hell? Punk And Ricky Starks is like, okay, I'll take it. And it's like, holy shit, he's actually going to do this. I feel like he kind of turns heel here. Then he scurries up the ramp snatches the trophy away from Juice and Thunder Liger, who's in the house, uh, one, one of Owen's longtime opponents, to, I guess, present the trophy. They were going to do the cup presentation on Battle of the Belts, which started after this. And the way he ran away with the trophy was pretty funny. Now, on Battle of the Belts, 
Martha Hart came out with Tony Khan. And I was at the Owen Cup final at Double or Nothing in Vegas last year. And I remember from my seat seeing Martha Hart kind of dancing as she was going back to the uh, the back. And I'm like, I wonder if they caught that on camera because she completely danced her way uh, to the back. Now she's coming out and she's dancing. She's got a little cowboy hat thing on and the whole thing. And Tony Khan, he looks like a little kid dressed up for Halloween. He's got his little cowboy outfit. And he does a little tip of the hat. He was just adorable. I just want to pick him up and smooch him. And that whole thing was nice. Martha gives her big speech, presents the trophies to Willow and Ricky. And Ricky didn't do anything dastardly here. I pitched, you know, if they really wanted to get heat, CM Punk could turn heel and give a GTS to Martha Hart. Imagine that. But they kept the cheating, like I said, to a minimum. I was like, I don't think we're ever really going to see, especially if they do the finals in Calgary like every year, but especially in Calgary. I don't think they would have done anything in either one of these match finishes that would have like potentially desecrated the name of Owen Hart. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people were speculating, could we see a CM Punk heel turn? Is he going to attack Ricky Starks or go heel or tell the fans to fuck off? I don't think they would do that with the backdrop of the Owen Hart Foundation charity and tournament. Just, I think they're going to try to keep it as clean as possible. And I was right because Willow is wholesome and she won. And then Ricky, even though he cheated, it was, eh, he just took it. No big deal. It wasn't, uh, you know, violent or anything like that, you know? So at the end of the day, I'm cool with it. I think it's awesome that Ricky Starks won this tournament. Now I mentioned in the last episode, if Ricky Starks wins, AEW needs to make sure they don't Wardlow him, you know, make sure that this tournament victory does mean something, you know, and if you do win it, it is a big deal. And it is something you should mention. So Ricky has had a couple of opportunities already. He's fallen short. Maybe this is something that can get him to a TNT title or an international title from Orange Cassidy. I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know if he really has a path to MJF's title right now. I feel like all in or all out is going to be MJF and Adam Cole. Um, but hopefully this helps Ricky and elevates his career in some way. Speaking of Battle of the Belts, Orange Cassidy successfully retained over Lance Archer via countout. Good to see Jake Snake, Jake the Snake Roberts out there. Luchasaurus retained his TNT title, defeating Sean Spears. And Tony Storm retained the AEW women's title, defeating Taya Valkyrie. That happened on Battle of the Belts. This coming week on Dynamite, we have Jungle Jack Perry taking on Hook for the FTW title. And we have the big Blood and Guts match. Now, I'm not going to be home to see this live, so... I will be giving you my thoughts on that, either on a quick mic drop on Thursday or probably on a short Saturday Winged Eagle podcast that we will do in the early afternoon uh, before Collision airs. Uh, we'll get into what happened there, and if I can find a, another time to get up prior to then, I will. Uh, we also had Triple Mania take place. Now, I only saw a few highlights of this, uh, but I know of uh, Vikingo defeated Kenny Omega, and then they had that incident at the end where Don Callis got attacked and choked by somebody who didn't know that it was an angle and that he was part of the show. So hopefully he's okay. He did come up here uh, to San Diego to get his ne neck looked at. Like I said, he's had a rough go of it. He took that, that shot, got his head cut up a few months ago, and now this. So hopefully Don Callis is okay and he can make it back to TV to be booed very, very loudly because uh, when it comes to booing Dom Dom and Don Don, that's pretty great. And... QT Marshall also defeated Penta in an ambulance match where he got bloody as hell. So QT, I don't like his uh, pairing at all with Powerhouse Hobbs. I'm glad that this whole thing looks like it's coming to an end, but this, this impressed me. Probably got him great heel heat down there in Tijuana. I could have gone to that. It was not even very far from me, but uh, Good stuff there. And like I said, the G1, I am kind of out of the loop on. I did take a look at the blocks and who has what, but I think it's kind of early on yet. And that's still a ways off from concluding. So we'll wait and talk about uh, the finals there when that happens. And then we should talk a little bit about some wrestling news. Just a couple of things. Nick Aldis apparently is done with Impact. It was a short-term deal. He just wrapped up business with their Slammiversary event, which I got a brief look at. Also saw... Uh, Eric Young returned to Impact as well, um, but Nick Aldis is now done with Impact, and apparently there's some rumblings about him going to WWE. Now, 
From what I remember, Bruce Pritchard does not like him for whatever reason. I can't remember why, but I know Bruce Pritchard has shit all over Nick Aldis for whatever reason. So I don't know how Nick Aldis is going to get in the door right now, considering Bruce is like number two in command. He's running things if Triple H is not there. So maybe these two can make up or whatever, but there's been talk of him even coming in as an agent, which I saw a lot of fans freaking out. Now, I don't know how Nick, how old Nick Aldis is, but let's not freak out about WWE seeing value in him as an agent. That's not an insult. Who says he can't do both? This is a guy that might be aging. He might not have 10 years in the ring, but he's also you know a longtime veteran, somebody that WWE could get use out of not only in the ring, but outside the ring. And maybe he's already in a position in his career where he can start thinking about what to do after wrestling and agenting or being a producer might be something that's in his future. I don't think that's bad. Um, Nick Aldis, if he was going to be a major star, he would have already been there by now. Nick Aldis is great and everything, but I think he, and he could do better. He's a great talent, but you know, his ceiling is kind of what it is. I don't think he can come come in WWE and take over Cody or Roman in popularity, but I do think that he would be a great get and there's still plenty of gas in his physical tank to do things with him in the ring. Maybe just being an agent or producer can be perhaps attached to that. I don't know. Um, just depends on what he wants to do, what WWE wants to do. We'll keep our eye out for Nick Aldis. I mentioned Eric Young a minute ago. He was granted his release by WWE because apparently he did not want to work with Vince McMahon. This is the first wrestler I think that we've heard of publicly that has made this the, his their reason for wanting to leave. Now, he was released during the COVID budget cuts, but then he was hired back after Vince McMahon left. But then after WWE sold to Endeavor, and it was apparent that Vince was going to be back in the fold, he requested his release. I think he cited, you know, moral reasons or whatever. He just didn't want to be associated with Vince McMahon and that and his behavior and all of that, and they granted his release. He got it just in time, I guess, to appear at Slammiversary, so that all happened, but I don't really watch Impact, so I'm not really into what they're doing. But I do know the uh, Nick Aldis and Eric Young story from this week. So good for Eric Young, standing up for what he believes, and he seems to be happy back in Impact, and we wish him the best. Eric Young rules. Uh, I mentioned the Cody Peacock doc coming out on July 31st. We talked about that earlier on, and apparently Peacock is raising its price $1. Is allowed. It's a very loud car goes by. A buck Peacock is raised across the board there regarding or whatever tier you have. I have whatever one you don't have to watch ads on. So I think I pay like 10 bucks and now it's going to go up to 11, I suppose. So that's going to go up a dollar. And the legendary Mantar has passed away. Good old Mantar. My God, Mantar was a brief character in the mid nineties and nine in WWE in like 1995. And he came in with that same class of TL Hopper and Salvatore sincere and all of that. They were all kind of coming in together. It felt like around that time he started out with a big moose head or ox head dress on him, kind of like a Mastodonish Vader type of thing, but that didn't last long. And he had weird eye makeup and he was a big guy, but he was just, a very strange gimmick. He was supposed to be half man, half beast. Did not last very long. I remember Bret Hart having a match with him and beating him. I don't think he got any title shots and won very many matches outside of a couple of enhancement matches. Now, he would turn up later. He would turn up in 96 at In Your House, Good Friends, Better Enemies. There was a match between the ultimate warrior and gold dust. And he was the ultimate, or he was gold dust's like bodyguard for that match. And he was also in the truth commission a year after that. So he, he was in WWE a couple of times, but uh, apparently he passed away age 55. He had a diabetes, I believe. And he suffered a couple of falls recently um, as well. One that's put him in the hospital, I think. And then as soon as he got home, he went to sleep and passed away in his sleep. So, uh, best wishes, condolences uh, out to the family of Mantar. And unfortunately, I just closed out my Mantar notes. And I wanted to say 
Mike Halleck is his name. I had it right there and then I lost it. I'm like, crap, what is a uh, Mantar's name? But Mike Halleck, uh, dead at the age of 55. Rest in peace, Mantar. You'll always be remembered. You know, like one thing about Mantar is that, you know, it's kind of that good publicity is any publicity is good publicity type of thing. Because whenever you're joking around about wrestling or making any sort of lighthearted joke about wrestling, Mantar's name tends to come up a lot. You're never going to have as big a career as Mantar, you know, that type of shit. Uh, SmackDown this past week, I should mention uh, the spot that they did with Shotzi, who appeared on the Tron after Bailey and EO were doing their thing, causing all that ruckus. And she begins to shave her head, kind of like a character change for her. And that's what it appeared to be on the surface at first. And then it was known shortly after that on Twitter that the reason that she's, or maybe not on Twitter, just on social media, it started getting around that the reason she's doing this is out of support for her sister who was just diagnosed with cancer. So this is kind of like a solidarity thing. We've seen that happen before. Um, you know, friends will shave their head just to support their friend who has to go through chemo and the hair loss and all that stuff. And it's a, it's a great thing to do for people you love. So uh, very cool that Shotzi did that. Some fans were, because I wasn't home for any of this. So I was uh, looking at my phone, scrolling through Twitter, and I saw WWE's video. And I quote tweeted, I'm like, way to go, Shotzi. You're going to love being bald. It's great. It's so easy. You just wake up and you're ready to go. And I wished her the best. And then underneath in the comments, people were like, oh, no, fans are mad or something that she's doing this for like blaming Vince McMahon. And you know, there's a bunch of people doing this. And I was like, well, that's fucking silly. This is something for her to do. If she's cool with shaving her head. I don't think they're forcing her to do this, really, although they might be. But <clears throat> That's not where my mind took me. I saw a crazy woman with green hair shaving, shaving her head on TV. I'm like, oh, this is a massive maybe character change for her. And then when you hear what the real reason is, that it's for her sister, I'm like, well, that's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Kudos to WWE for letting her do that. <coughs> but I think what happened was is that there are a lot of people, and I've been speaking out against this a lot lately in the last few weeks, of, you know, the people who are like really, really uppity about Vince McMahon and everything. And I'm like, well, yeah, shut the fuck up. Yes, he's weird. He's going to be around. He's going to affect things from time to time. But you cannot ignore just the numbers right now. What's going on in WWE, how much they have improved since he's been gone. Everything they're doing is better across the board. You know, with still some problems, Triple H isn't perfect, but compared to when it was Vince there at Gorilla every week, ripping up scripts, changing shit, you know, writing nonsensical TV week after week that meant nothing, that put the wrestler's body through wear and tear that they didn't need. Nothing was had any soul to it at all. It was completely uninspiring. You know, and now it's like we're caring about the characters. We have Roman, one of the most over heels in recent memory, memory. Cody, one of the most over baby faces in recent memory. Lots of people like Sami Zayn, Jey Uso, Kevin Owens, Gunther, really getting on the map, getting over Rhea Ripley, Bianca Belair. You know, it's not just all about the philosophy that they had when Vince was in charge. Push the Charlottes and push the Cenas and nobody else. A lot of people are getting opportunities. Damian Priest is walking around with a briefcase right now. Finn Balor might not win another world championship. They've been drawing insane record houses for WrestleManias and attendance and ratings on Fox. Everything is good, 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 good. To me, minor Vince McMahon influences, little bits where he wants to stick his disgusting, weird face into the business and fuck it up a little bit. As bad as that sucks, it's still way better than when he was fully headsetted back there sitting right next to that curtain manipulating and micromanaging every single goddamn thing that came in front of them. We are in a much better place now. So to immediately attribute that to Vince is just sad. You know, like we should have given the girl a chance. We should have given WWE a chance to explain what they were doing before we start flying off the rails at some decision that was guaranteed to be a Vince McMahon call. I looked up what guaranteed means. It's not that. So I think that a knee-jerk reaction like that, this is a good lesson to learn. You know, sometimes not only is it not what you think, 
but it's something that you know is is really touching and heartwarming when you think about it. That's amazing solidarity. One of a restaurant I worked at uh, back in North Carolina. My job there as a GM, I was there ten years, and for some reason, we just happened. And I had my my shaved head. This would have been like two thousand six, and for some reason, we had three other bald guys working there. Two of them were tall and skinny like me, and the other one was shorter. And there would be plenty of nights where we were all working together. And one time, I get call, I get motioned over from uh, a table. Or I'm sorry, a, a waitress gets motioned over, and she comes up to me, and she goes, you know what my table just asked me? She asked me if one of you guys have cancer. Because she thought this was like a solidarity thing. Because the only men working that night were us, and we were all bald. So people do that. It's a very common thing. And I think it's awesome that Shotzi's doing that. And uh, best of luck to her sister, who now is battling cancer. I didn't see um, the type or the severity of this cancer that her sister has. Uh, I just wish her the absolute best. Cancer sucks. It affects so many people. It affects us all. And it just fucking sucks. So best of luck to the sister of Shotzi. I didn't catch her name, but uh, very cool. So we'll see now. Shotzi's going to be on TV with a shaved edge, you know, a little helmet on. She might still do her thing. But I feel like if they're going to go through the trouble of shaving her head too, they should take advantage of this. You know, make her a little crazier. Make her a little edgier. Hopefully Bailey's okay because I would like to see Bailey kind of fear Shotzi and like run from her. That would be fun. So that maybe depends on Bailey, but we'll see. Shotzi now is going to be wrestling on TV, looking a lot different. We'll see how it, uh, how it goes. I'm sure there's probably already some footage of a live event out there somewhere. So fun stuff there. But that concludes the end of my notes. Holy shit, two hours and 15 minutes. I've been yapping, and a lot of it has just been drivel, driving you guys crazy. Greg, wondering when he's going to shut the fuck up. Look, uh, we've had pretty low audiences lately. Channels acting very weird. We have very great numbers. Subscribers are moving up, and the views do really well, but they do well like a day or two after. So we had a pretty low audience tonight, but we'll let this video simmer tomorrow the next day. It's going to boost right up. It's weird. There must have been an algorithm thing or something because my, my, my numbers are all doing different things, but they're doing good things because they're all going up. And we are on the road to 40,000 subscribers. We should be there pretty soon. So if you're not a subscriber, please do that. Smash that thumbs up button for me on your way out the door, but I'm not leaving yet. I'm going to go over here to the chat and see if you guys have anything else left to say. And then I'm going to roll out of here. I also want to make sure there were no super chats I missed or anything like that. Yeah, Stephen Harris, Triple H. Some of those people have been kind of absent, but I think hopefully they're kind of in de development. They're figuring out what to do with them. Pretty much the entire faction of the way is off TV right now. Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae and... Uh, Johnny Gargano. We haven't seen Piper Niven, Niven in a while. LA Knight, I've got high hopes for, though. Um, we did talk about that last week, about him uh, challenging theory for the title. It looks like that's going to be what they're doing now. I didn't even catch what's going on on SmackDown. All I know is he's a part of some mat, multi-man match that's going to be his number one contender. So LA Knight theory at SummerSlam is going to be incredible because you got a great opportunity. You got a guy that the fans love and a guy that the fans hate, and those are always the best. And LA Knight, I think just winning a championship in general would get a great response from the audience in Detroit. But him beating that specific champion, Austin Theory, who's just douche from head to toe. Oh, Motown's going to love it. Greg's going to love it. You guys are going to love it. I can't wait. Trinity won the Knockouts Championship. Thank you, Juliet. I did know that as well. Yes, Nick Aldis is uh, married to Mickey, Mickey James, although WWE wasn't treating Mickey James very well either. I did see both of them at WrestleCon, actually. Uh, Nikki, or Nikki, Nikki and Mickey. I wonder if they call each other that. I wonder if Nikki and Mickey is written on their towels. You know, how you have like embroidered towels, married couples. Please tell me they have Nikki and Mickey towels. They better. Grim Reaper, good mic work. Dilf, how you doing? I'm doing good. Is Dilf an insult? Oh, I think I might understand what Dilf means now. But I'm not a dad. I'm just a dude. 
All right, right on. Yeah, I. Okay, see, I haven't even seen the uh, the footage of the uh, the injury to pretty deadly number one, whichever one it is. Um, I haven't learned their names yet. I will give me until twenty twenty five, and I'll know both their names. That's reasonable. Chill out. But uh, no, I didn't see the actual move that injured him. But the fact that uh, Ridge Holland was present is going to just, that's just naturally what fans do. And that's why I don't take much stock in that because it's usually coming from people who probably couldn't even dribble a basketball, you know, going to criticize somebody's athletic ability, ring work. When they're the professionals, they're the ones in there. They're the ones getting clearance to go out there. You know, back in the day, they would just toss anything, anybody in the ring. They were putting 16 year old Jeff Hardy in the ring in 1994. They didn't give a fuck. Things are way, way different now. You got to pass all sorts of different things, you know, to get your ass actually in there and in the ring and on live TV. You have to know what you're doing and you have to get that green light from your coaches and the people around you. And Ridge Holland has that. And these have all just been unfortunate circumstances. And the way I look at things too is that. The only people that I think really have a right to criticize the guy are people within WWE who are either a coach or a wrestler. If a few wrestlers go to management and say, hey, look, he's a really nice guy and everything, but I'm scared to work with Ridge Holland. I don't want to work with him. If they hear that enough, you know, that these are who we have to trust to handle these situations. As fans, we don't know the story. We don't know what it's like in the ring. You don't know the timing and what goes into it and all of that. So it's really easy just to make a blind assumption, which wrestling in general, especially online, is nothing but blind assumptions. That's all it is. And instead of that, you know, why don't you let the professionals do the job that they're paid to do? And if Ridge Holland is really, really dangerous, they will have people in the company that will be aware of that. It's not like we're going to notice and WWE's not. They got 10,000 fucking eyeballs on those monitors back there. Every, everybody watching every damn thing. And they see shit. And we've heard stories of how they nitpick and micromanage and tell wrestlers not to do things. I'm like, what that? What the fuck? You, you don't want them touching the rope with that way or using all five fingers or what? You know, just like little stupid shit. So they pay attention to everything. So they got this. They don't need you. They don't need, they don't need you, Jimmy or Greg or Rodrigo, or Juliet or any of us. They don't need us. Let them figure out who's safe to work in the ring and who's not. And let the fans shut their fucking mouth and enjoy their entertainment. And stop being a side seat, back seat quarterback who doesn't even know how to quarterback. That's the worst. Elton Prince, thank you. That's his name, Elton Prince. That's fantastic. I'm a massive fan of both. Elton John and Prince. I'm not even sure which one I like more. Maybe Prince by like a half a point, but not much. I love me some Elton John. That's awesome. That's his name. What's the other one's name? Oh, I got to look him up now. Is it, so if it's Elton Prince, is it... Uh, I'm trying to think who else it would be. It would be George. George Michael. And who's somebody else like George Michael? I'll just look him up. Need to look it up over here. There we go. I'll look this up and then we will get out of here. I took so long to, to learn the Usos apart. I could not tell them apart for the longest time. Kit Wilson. Okay, Kit Wilson. Okay, so maybe... Uh, oh, who's Kit from? Wilson, like maybe Wilson Phillips. And Kit, like the Knight Rider... Uh, car oh my god crazy anywho well i think that's gonna wrap it up for tonight guys thank you for just hanging out with me and letting me just ramble uh because it's been a wild week and i had a lot to catch up on here and it's gonna be a busy week for me i got a lot going on so uh, i wanted to make sure i got up here and talked to you guys as long as i could so hopefully you've enjoyed this two and a half hour long podcast keep a lookout on the channel for the links to thursdays Saturday night's main event members only watch along of episode three. And then this coming Sunday, let's take a look at that poll right now. Actually, uh, this coming Sunday, we will be watching a classic pay-per-view 
The poll is up on my community tab right now. And so far, 254 votes. And we have SummerSlam 2001 leading the way with 57% of the vote. Second place is SummerSlam 2003. SummerSlam 01, 57%. SummerSlam 03, 19%. Bash at the Beach 2000, 14%. And Bash at the Beach 98, 11%. So if you want Bash at the Beach 98, 2000 or SummerSlam 2003, Get over to Twitter, I'm sorry, get over to YouTube and go to my channel and vote on that poll because so far, SummerSlam 2001 is running away with it. I will wait until tomorrow and I will take the final results and post the link for you guys. So thanks again for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday night and I will catch you guys Thursday for the members only. Y'all take care.